This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Isotope, Adam Audio, Lewitt, and Spectra 1964. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Lewitt PureTube microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX110D mic pre and C610 complimeter with Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes below. It's a great way to help support this show. Now get ready to rock. But 99.9% of what I do is all plug-in based, and the console is used more as a mastering tool. And then again, the one thing mainly is, is volume rides. So again, there's still, once I've hit the sweet spot, getting the drums into the console, right? I can't raise them in Pro Tools because I'll start to clip. So I have to use the console automation. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Howdy, rock stars. I've got a secret to tell you about how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars. My secret is using Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX Breath Control, D Click, D Clip, D S. Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limiting, all from Isotope. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding much closer to professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins in Pro Tools, and the best part is that these mixing techniques work for you in any DAW, whether you're on Logic, Cubase, Studio One, Reaper, anything you can think of. If you're ready now to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Tom Lord Algae, a.k.a. TLA, a multi-Grammy winning mixer who started out as a young engineer in New York, like his older brother, Chris Lord Algae. Tom began his career as a touring lighting director before being thrown into the front of house seat when the original front of house engineer went ill. After five years of touring, Tom moved his focus to studio work and with his brother Chris worked at Unique Recording in New York. Then later, he was the resident mixer at what used to be known as South Beach Studios, located on the ground floor of the Marlin Hotel in Miami Beach, Florida, which is actually where I got to meet Tom and work with him for a very awesome few weeks many years ago. TLA received two Grammy Awards for his work on Steve Winwood's Back in the High Life in 1986 and Roll With It in 1988, both winning in the Best Engineered Recording Non-Classical category. His third Grammy was for Santana's Supernatural in 1999, which won Album of the Year. Tom has mixed records for U2, Simple Minds, the Rolling Stones, Pink, Peter Gabriel, OMD, Sarah McLaughlin, Dave Matthews Band, Blink-182, Avril Lavigne, Hanson, Sum 41, Live. Man, this list goes on. The Wallflowers, Weezer, Manic Street Preachers, Newfound Glory, Story of the Year, and Marilyn Manson, among many, many others. He's yeah. mixed a ton of records. Sometimes it's easier just to say anything, everything from Manson to Hanson and everything in between. Exactly. <laughs> 
Tom now resides in Austin, Texas, where he's built two mixing rooms. Spank Studios ATX has his TLA's SSL 4064G Plus console and ORG Studios at ATX ha- and ORG Studios. <laughs> I'm, this is the part I edit the shit out of. And ORG there, right? Studios <laughs> and AT, ORG ATX Studios, which houses my SSL Origin console. Right, that's the new one that, you, that we're that's excited the, to talk yeah, about. Yeah, so I built, you know, right, they cool. say everything is big in Texas. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I have a Texas-sized house. It's just, nice. it's my wife and I and our, our dog Jagger, named after Mick Jagger. Um, and, and we have this ludicrously large house large enough that I was able to build two studios. So when I moved in here, obviously we're in Spank, uh, ATX. Yeah. So Spank Studios is my main stereo mixing room. It houses this beautiful SSL 4000 series console that this particular console I've worked on, this was South Beach Studios console. So when they went out of business, I bought it. Um, but this exact console, you know, we mixed... You know, Blink-182, I mixed a Weezer. Pretty much anything that I mixed at South Beach Studios was mixed on this console. Console was built in 1993. South Beach Studios, I think, bought it in 1996. So mm-hmm. we've had it that long. It, 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 and basically, I, I'm pretty much the only one that's worked on it for most of its life. And it's nice to be here. But yes, yeah, so this is my main stereo mixing room. And while this studio was being built... Um, when I moved, when we moved into the house, I immediately just dropped the origin. There's a, a room up in the, on the second story of the house that has a movie theater. Um, and it was a perfect size room for, you know, small control room. Um, and I dropped the origin, uh, the SSL origin in there. And that allowed me to, uh, to, you know, pretty much within, within three weeks, we were up and running, at least with me being able to work. Um, and I worked up there for about five or six months while this room was being built out. That's awesome, man. I've sat in front of that console. I sat, I had the pleasure it's awesome. a while back of it's sitting awesome. with you for a few weeks in front of that console. It's um this con well, yeah, the four thousand consoles is my favorite. While I was building the four thousand room, I can remember thinking, Oh, maybe I should drop the origin in here. Um there so having worked on I worked on the origin. So just a quick backstory. I lived in Miami Beach for oh God, twenty three or twenty four years. Um And in 2015, when South Beach Studios went out of business, I moved the studio to my house at the time. Um, It actually, when I bought the house in 1999, it had a studio in it. Um, And I tore it out because I never wanted a studio in my house. So I ended up putting it back in. Um, So for the last five years or six years that I lived in that house, I had this in the the house. Um, When I sold the house, again, I lived in that house for over 20 years. I bought another house in Miami Beach, and it didn't have the space for this console. So I bought an Origin, and I built a mixing room in that house. Um, we lived in the house for seven months, and somebody just came and knocked on the door and, and offered me a ludicrous amount of money for it. Nice. And uh, th- that whole time, I mean, I really wanted to move to Austin the first time, but we couldn't find anything, you know, when we looked the first time. So I was able to, uh, you know, we, we came out basically every weekend to Austin looking for houses, you know, and we ended up finding one, obviously. But yeah, so uh, that's the reason I bought the Origin, and I liked it so much that I kept it. The Origin is, is, a, is a great console. The, the, I think it sounds amazing, and I'm going to continue using it. It's actually going to be, um, I'm going to convert that room into my Atmos room. So I'll do all my stereo mixes down here, and then I'll go upstairs and do the breakout for, for Atmos. Um, but awesome. I love the Origin console. It's, it sounds amazing. It's a wonderful console. And, and the best thing about it is it's brand new. So it's like you turn it on and it's just rock solid. Th- this baby is rock solid as well, but it requires a little bit of love and a little finessing, you know, which I'm well versed in. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I love both rooms and, and look forward to when I get the uh, Atmos rig up and running. So what's awesome about this is... Um you're so ready to rock that I didn't even finish my intro. So the, I'll finish it. <laughs> so sure. Shocking. No, they'll know what, it's, what it is. But uh, I wanted to give a shout out also to Phil Wagner and Fady Hayek over at SSL for connecting us. SSL is great. Thank you, guys. Um, and here's the, here's the official line that I always say, Tom. 
Please welcome Tom Lord Algy to Recording Studio Rockstars. Tom, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. I'm always ready to rock. <laughs> I knew it, man. I knew it. So, yes, um, let me let me uh, mention a couple of things. One is I had the incredible honor to work with you for a few weeks, and I think that was 99 going into 2000 or 98 going into 99 when we were doing the Atrixo It record. sounds about right. Yeah. And that was at South Beach Studios, sitting right in front of that very console. That's right. That's right. Which was such a cool place to be. It was so it was so awesome to just like walk out in the warm sunshine and yep. come into that. And there was always a DJ playing vibey stuff in the lounge as yep. you walked in to go to the studio. Yeah, I'm, I miss that place. As we're, I was very fortunate to be able to work there for 20 years, and it was awesome. Yeah, it never got old. You know, like we would be in there working. And some nights I'd work till, I don't know, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And, and you'd open the door to leave the control room, you know, to to leave the studio. And it would be like, it's the second you open the door, the bar was hopping. So it'd be like a roar of sound. And you just walked out <laughs> in the middle of this, like, bar. It's literally what it was. You walked out in the middle of the Marlin bar. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there was always something good going on. And it was good times. And then, of course, upstairs from the studio on the second floor of the, of the hotel, was um, elite modeling, so oh, it was a, right. it was a parade of models all day. Um, so yeah, sometimes I take a break and I have a, l- a lunch out in the veranda of the hotel, and, and again, it was just a, a parade of fucking models walking in and out. And, and oddly enough, um, you know, one of those models ended up being my wife, who is no longer my wife, but I ended up marrying one of the models, <laughs> as one That's does. Great. As one great. does, but yeah, it was a, it was a great time, and yeah, it was a block from the beach, you know. Yeah. So again, it was it was the one thing I loved about it was if I ever needed to just clear my head or just kind of sometimes you need to walk away from what you're doing. You might be hitting a brick wall. Literally, you just walk out the door of that hotel, and you know the whole vibe of that area, the Art Deco buildings, and you know being at the beach, you know, it sort of cleared your head immediately. You know, and it was, yeah. it was, it was a great, it was a great time. You know, I, they were, uh, yeah, I had a good time in South Florida, no doubt. Um, and then wasn't it, the hotel was owned by Chris Blackwell of Island Records or something yep. like that, right? Chris Blackwell owned it. He, he was the one that put the studio in, in the, in the, in the early nineties. And, uh, yeah, it was Chris's hotel and it was just fabulous. You know, we went through, Chris ended up selling it. You know, as 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 he as things changed in his life, and and I think that Island Records was was focusing more on their move, doing movies. You know, I really don't know the the whole story, you know, but I know eventually he sold the place, and we went through, you know, th- two or three different owners, and I was always shocked that anybody that had bought the hotel after Chris owned it, you know, that they wanted to keep the studio. So we went through two owners after that that kept the studio there. Um, wow. which was great because again, to me, it was like, it was a no brainer of like, if you're buying this multi million dollar hotel, you know, every square foot matters in Miami beach. Why yeah. would you be wasting it on a recording studio that doesn't generate the type of income that say a hotel room or, or a bar or a restaurant would do. So, um, we were very fortunate. And then again, in 2015, it sold again. And, and that's when the shoe dropped and the owners were like, Oh no, 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 no. You know, so but We're I had in saw the, of America. <laughs> I had seen the writing on the wall. I had seen the writing on the wall, and actually, for the past, you know, before before it closed, probably twelve months earlier, I had already begun the process of doing the build out in my house to the studio. So it required a, because it was a second story over a garage. You know, I had to reinforce the floor, you know, and put a lot of soundproofing in between the you know the floor and the garage. Because uh, the one thing I, I, I knew is that a, a second story with that big open floor, it, 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 the bottom end would have been a little bit funny. So I really stiffened up the floor and uh, and it worked out really well. So I, I had done a lot of the work. So, you know, when South Beach Studios closed, we literally had, I think, 30 days or 45 days to get out. Wow. Uh, you know, and I just bought the contents and uh, my brother Jeff came down and we just emptied it out. You know, and it, it was funny because... This console had to be disassembled completely to be removed from the room, which worked out perfectly because it had to be disassembled anyway to get into my room at the house. So that worked out perfectly. But yeah, my brother Jeff and I did the bulk of the work, you know, and and 
I, I had hired a company to move the console. But when I realized once it was broken down, it was just like, you know, the frame itself was just like two manageable pieces. And he and I just threw it in the back of a pickup truck. That's you know, wild. it That's saved wild. me like four thousand dollars, you know, that they wanted to move it two miles. Um, but yeah, and, and we were able to get the whole job done from the day that South Beach closed to the day that I opened the studio at the house, I think was six weeks, you know, for, for the building the room and getting everything up and running and putting the console back together. And it worked out perfectly. And when I sold the house, because I had on a freaking awesome house. It was a water. I remember that house. It was a waterfront house, and it was amazing. Um, I was able to to negotiate um, them just cutting a hole in the wall, you know. So the buyer actually cut a hole in the wall, hired a crane to come in, and we just pulled the console out of the room intact. Because I was like, I am not taking that console apart again. Wow! <laughs> so we were able to just pull it out, craned it out, dropped it in a truck. And uh, I had put it in storage for a year. And then when I when I bought the Austin house, I went down again with my brother, Jeff. I rented a you know 26-foot straight job, filled it up with the console and all the gear that I had in storage. You know, and uh, and we drove to Austin and literally just rolled it right into the room. It was awesome. Wow. You know, and then I wired, you know, once this room, once I had the room built out, then, then uh, I wired the console up myself, which was, again... I was shocked, you know, because I had a guy that was going to do it. And he got he got a little flaky and, and he bailed on me. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to try this. And oddly, I mean, shockingly, I wired it up and it freaking works. <laughs> wow, man. I remember when we were mixing at South Beach, that was one of the first times I saw exactly what you're talking about, which is, you were in the middle of a mix and then you got frustrated. Like, like sometimes I get frustrated at the mouse on my computer. You got frustrated at a fader. Next thing I knew, we were like, holy shit, you had pulled the fader pack out of the console and you were like doing quick tech work and like replacing stuff yep. and dusting things off, put yep. it back in. And I saw, I saw how much, you know, that was an example of how you got to know the tools. Like that, you know? Yeah, it's, well, look, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I miss... I miss the, the days of working in recording studios where we had a full, full, full-time full maintenance staff. Yeah. You know, like at the Hit Factory. Man, the years at the Hit Factory were awesome. You know, if anything. For God's sake, if you just blew a fuse on something, you know what I mean? Just call maintenance and they come in and sort it out. But, I mean, it, it was awesome. So when I got to Miami Beach, there was no maintenance staff. <laughs> you know, I mean, no full-time <laughs> right. maintenance staff. There, right. There's... There's Ross Alexander, the maintenance guy, engineer who built the room. And, you know, you could call him up. And if you had an emergency, he could get there pretty much very quickly. But um, I just figured, you know, I'm going to need to learn about this console. So over the, you know, the 20 years I worked there, I was pretty much did most of the maintenance to the console. So I got pretty well versed in, in how the console functions. And and uh, I am, I've amassed a, a significant amount of spares you know, right, right. So, because you, I mean, well, as a as a working engineer, you got to, you can't be down for too long. If there's an issue, you need to be able to solve it. Yeah, that's. So I'll probably drop in things I learned from Tom Lord Algae in my three weeks working with him. But one of them was a quote you you said when we were there. You said, "When you find something that you really love and you want to use it on mixing, always buy five of them." Yeah, yeah. And just have them ready because yes. you can't you can't lose a day. You know. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, that, would explain, that would explain why I have like 10 pairs of NS10s. Right. <laughs> are you now, so are you still mixing on NS10s? Is this oh, yeah. still part of your workflow today? Yeah, yeah. All right. On the console. So these are the NS10. Oh, God, which ones are they? I think they're like NS10X. They're magnetically sealed boxes, and, and they sound exactly like regular NS10 studios. Um, but the reason I bought them is because they were the last incarnation of NS10s, I believe, if not close to the last. So they probably have 10 years less time on them. Mm -hmm. You know, and some guy in Japan had them and they're, they're, they sound amazing, you know? That's great. Yeah. And then, like I said, I have a, I have a, 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 an equipment room that's just, there's just a shelf with just NS10s, you know, you know, because I, I think when I moved the studio into my house, I went I went to my mom's house and I poached hers. 
I'd given my mom two sets of, of the original NS10s back in the 80s. You know, so hers were pristine. But I, I'm like, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need these. And I bought her a new sound system. Um, and I pinched the NS10s. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what parents, well, that's what parents are supposed to be for, there for us like that. My studio is proudly powered by OWC, and I love how it's improved my workflow. OWC can connect all your audio work drives, trackballs, mix controllers, MIDI keyboards, audio interfaces, displays, or cameras so that you can work fast and focus on making your best record ever. Go look at the Mini Stack STX, Thunder Bay 4, or Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars to find the perfect solution for your studio from OWC. You know, as soon as I finished working with you, I came back to Nashville. And the very first thing I did was pick up a pair of Anis 10s and a Bryston 4B power amp. That's right. <laughs> and I used them for a long, long time. You know, up until just recently when I finally blew a driver and I just didn't have a replacement right away. And then I haven't gone back yet. But yeah, so um, what you can, so here's, I know that the, the replacements are hard to find. Okay, so here's the workaround. You know, you buy the replacements for the Avatones. You know the CLA tens, yeah, and just yep. drop that in. They, I've done that in a pinch. You know what I mean? They sound great. So, so and, the and, CLA um, speakers, yeah, the white. Um, how that, do you describe them? The white cone with the black dot, right? The sound. Um, I can I can just repl- I can get those cones and put them in as well if yeah. I need to, or, uh-huh. or the rock stars. Yeah, you okay, shouldn't. You, you know. I would recommend if you did it, you'd probably it'd probably be best to do if you're doing woofers. I would do both woofers. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. But to be honest, I mean, I've never tried just doing one. But I mean, when I, I've done it in the past. You know, where where I had an issue. You know, like what happens is sometimes they get fatigued, and the bottom end will make a little noise. You know what I mean? And um, you know, I swapped it out once, and I'm like, oh, it sounds like almost exactly the same. You know, and at like you know half or a third of the price. A um, couple of other thoughts I remember you saying. One was, you know, we, we can often get caught up in like, what kind of fancy speaker cables do we need? And you're like, oh, man, we just get zip wire and threw them in there. Yeah. Yep. Which I guess is that that's like the electrical wire, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, z- speaker wire. So, I mean, in here, I'm just, to be honest, I mean, I'm just using four lead speaker wire. You know, it's like home, consu- you know, consumer audio yeah. speaker wire has four leads in it. You know, that, that, that to me was the easiest way. So four leads wrapped up in it, you know, and that's what I use. That's what I've always used or, or, you know, or just regular speaker wire, you right, know, right but on. yeah, I know these guys with using the monster cable and it's that, and the other thing I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. That's great. Now, what about uh subwoofer? Is that something that you found useful in the studio? And what, and what advice do you have for the rock stars about that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you need one. You got to have one. Modern music, you got to have it. <clears throat> I've used them all. And um, I've been using JBL. I'd have to do the research to find out what the model is. So, yeah, you're going to need a subwoofer. You're going to need a subwoofer. And I've been using this JBL. And the reason I use the reason I chose the JBL is because it's a pro version. It's a pro audio version. It has XLR inputs. Most of the subwoofers I used in the past were consumer audio ones, you know, self-powered. They're all self-powered. Consumer audio, which pr- presents a little problem because it runs at a different level. Um, so this one is a pro audio one, and it seems to work the best. Again, it's like 400 bucks. I got it on Amazon. I believe it's a, either a 10 or a 12-inch, you know, so it does it does a fine job. And, and again, I just use that with the NS10s. And then I have my Barefoot MM27s. Uh, I use a, a KRK 10-inch uh, or 12-inch with that. And then on my mains, I don't use one. I have the, the MM20, um, MM12s on, uh, barefoots on the, on the mains. But yeah, got to have a subwoofer. But it, again, if you're working with pro audio, you know, like a plus four level, you know, I recommend getting a subwoofer that has XLR inputs that's yeah. able to handle a plus four. Um, do you find a useful location for the sub for somebody who's setting up for the first time? And do you just sort of adjust it and tweak it by ear until you like it? Well, yeah, you, you adjust and tweak it by, you got to, obviously it has to be tweaked by ear. But for me, 
I believe this JBL that I bought, it is, it's a downward firing sub. I'm not a, I, I'm not a believer in those. So any, I had a bunch of, I have a bunch of the downward firing subs. And I, I, I am a firm believer that the speaker cones need to be lined up. So basically what I'm saying is that the, the, the speaker cone of the subwoofer needs to be roughly at the same point that the NS10 speaker cone is. Right on. You know, so if you just yeah, drew a straight line down, you know what I mean? It, it should be line up. You want that. It's important. So I just have the thing laying on its side with it. You know, the speaker actually aimed at me with the, the, uh, the speaker cone is on axis with the NS10 speaker cones. And then again, you, you'll, you'll, you'll adjust the crossover. I, this one, I believe, only has a switch crossover as opposed to some that have a variable crossover. So this made it a little bit easier. And then again, what I did is I had my wife down here while I was playing audio, you know, and I'll have her, okay, hit the phase button, you know, hold your hand up when it's out of phase and put your hand up when it's in phase. And I would just sit and listen to audio, you know, and make my decision on which one, which way is best, you know, and then I would have her make the adjustment on the volume, you know. That's great. So That's yeah, great. unfortunately it requires sometimes two people when you're doing the fine tuning, but it's one of those things, once you have it set, you know, I take a picture of it. So that if, if I bump into it, I know what the setting is, you know, it's kind of just set it and forget it. And then you're, you're good to go. But yeah, it's, it's important because the NS10s, you know, back in the day, I never mixed with the subwoofer with the NS10s, you know, probably wasn't until in early nineties, I started using the subwoofer, you know, but you need to be able to hear those frequencies. It makes sense. It's like with the, the, um, with CDs everywhere and digital audio, it kind of changed what was available in low and in record making, didn't it? Yes, it did. Um, I, I almost picture when you're talking about the speaker cones lined up, there's a little bit of that front of house mixer. Yeah, coming, yeah, I guess that's where it comes things from. Things you learn there. Yeah. It's, I guess, oh. uh, you know, and they, they say that it's, you know, they say bass isn't directional and, you know, I, again, I've tried many different configurations, you know, with the subwoofer in the back of the room, off to the side, and again, for me, if it's not lined up with the speaker cone of the monitors that it's going with, it always just sounds funny to me. It just doesn't, it just doesn't, it lacks the punch that I was looking for. Yeah. I'm going to say one, there's one certainty, which is your mixes sound killer. So maybe we'll start with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever the tech is behind it. Uh, let's start with, with the things that you're doing right, which is awesome. Um, all right. So let's see, Tell, give us like a brief version of how you got into this stuff, if you want to. I know you've told this story many times, so maybe if you want to give us, you know, a little bit of a brief arc on how do you get into the recording stuff early on. I, I did find when I was doing research, there's a great photo of you and your brother when you, you look like you're in your teens on Facebook, too. Wow. Um, but uh, t <laughs> tell us a little bit about how you got, you know, it's yeah, it's, in the beginning. It's kind of, I suppose it's the genesis of it was, was you know, preteen or just maybe 11 or 12 years old. And, you know, so I'm the youngest of six. You know, um, Chris, Jeff, and I were very close. And we pretty much grew up together. My, my sister, who's the next oldest after Chris, um, they shipped her out. They sent her away to private school because they saw that that these three boys are going to be a bad influence on, you know, my older sister. And, and then my, the next in line, my older brother, Mark, he had already moved out by the, by that time. Like, I think he moved out of the house when I was like 10 years old. So, and then my oldest sister, Meg, again, she was already gone. So it was pretty much Chris, Jeff and myself. And the, the genesis of it was, you know, pretty much from Chris and Jeff, their audio systems that they had, you know, Chris was well into audio. He always had a good stereo, you know, he had a couple of turntables and a little, you know, turntable mixer. And, you know, of course, any second, any chance that I could, I would be in there trying to, you know, figure out how it worked and make cassettes and this, that, and the other thing, you know, Chris and Jeff would catch me and they'd beat the shit out of me, <laughs> you know, because they don't want their little brother hanging around. And you guys are growing up in New York? Yeah, New Jersey, New you Jersey, know, we, yeah. we're the suburb of New York City. Um, this was actually in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Um, it was great, a great town. And uh, yeah, so it was like a, screwing around with the stereo. And Chris had a, 
a Sound Craftsman dual 10 band graphic equalizer. You know, and that was kind of my introduction to equalization. You know, I would screw around with it, you know, and I remember, you know, I was probably 13 years old, like saving every cent that I could, you know, and finally saving enough to buy my own. And I actually still have it, you know. Wow. Yeah, so that was that was kind of my soiree into audio or my 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 introduction into audio. You know, and then Chris Chris and Jeff were both musicians, so like they, they would have a band, you know, so I would hang around them when they were practicing and you know, there was always a PA and light show, so I kind of learned all that stuff from then. And uh I kind of gravitated toward the, the lighting, you know, and then when I when I turned 16, I'd gotten an offer, you know, from probably like a friend of Chris's who had a band, you know, to go, hey, you want to do lights for us? And, you know, we're a touring band and, you know, we tour, you know, pretty much the Northeast. And I'm like, sure. You know, my mom was a jazz musician. She signed me out of school. She's like, as long as you have a gig, you know, then I I, I support you. I will sign you out of school. And, and that's basically at 16, I was working in bars. I wasn't even legal to drink. I wasn't even supposed wow. to be in the darn bar. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it was different times back then, but I did that. And yeah, as the story goes, I was doing lights and sound man got sick one day, one gig before the gig and the band's like, you're going to do sound tonight. And of course my first response was, can I do lights as well? And they're like, no, I'm like, okay. So I guess I did a good job because from then on I did, I did, I did front of house and, you know, over a period of time, you know, I worked with different bands. I bought my own PA system and I would rent it out to the bands. And then I got, it was uh, probably 1982 going into 83 or it might've been 83 going into 84. And a band I was working with, they were doing a gig New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve is big, big, you know, night in the industry, you know, and the band gets paid like quadruple on New Year's Eve. So I just asked them, you know, to have a little taste of the action. You know, it's New Year's Eve. Could I get, a, you know, an increase in, in my pay for the evening. And they said, no. And I said, well, you know, I don't think that that's fair. And if you don't give me a taste of the action, you know, a, a, a little piece of the pie, so I'm going to pack up my gear and leave. And they said, well, we're not going to do that. And I said, okay. And I packed up my gear and I left. Wow. And I never looked back. And that was it. So a week you had, later. You had a bold entrepreneurial spirit in, early on. Yeah, well... Again, I mean, I just felt that, you know, if you guys are getting paid like four times what you normally get paid, you know, I, I, I think that's great for you guys. I don't think that I should get paid four times, you know what I mean? But I, 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 because it's New Year's Eve, I would like an increase in what you would normally pay me. Yeah. Um, but that was the right move because, uh, you know, Chris had been planted a bug in my ear. He was saying, uh, he, he, said, he was always saying, hey, you should knock off that live stuff and come work with me in the studio. I said, I think you'll do really well. So again, that was, you know, once this happened, I was like a week later, I started in the studio. That's and, that, and that's how, that's kind of how it began. I feel like I remember you telling a story about riding scooters to the studio or something yeah. like that. Is that, is so, that right? <laughs> there was this thing called a go-ped. It's a, so think of those little push-and-go scooters. You know, you put one foot on it, you push it, and then you stand on it and ride, and you know, it's got the fold-up handlebars. So this was the exact same thing, except it had a weed whacker motor on it. I, I don't know. I was doing uh, I was doing some live gig with Winwood, with Steve Winwood. We were recording a live show up in Boston. And I saw some guy riding this fucking thing. It had a motor on it. It's like a push and go scooter, it had a motor on it. You know, so I went up to him and asked him where he got it. And he's like, Oh, a friend of mine makes them. Yes, yeah, so I called the guy up and we bought like 10 of them. <laughs> I gave them out to all my friends and my brothers. And what I used to do is I lived in New Jersey and I would drive my car in the city and the parking was expensive. So now I would park, you know, on the on the west side by the Hudson River, you know, where it was like $5 a day versus $50 a day in Midtown. And I would pull this thing out of the trunk of my car, fold it up, and then I would ride it to 10 or 15 blocks to the studio. You know, and then of course, I've, as, as you've got more confident with it, you know, there would be those drunken nights you know, of like going from Times Square down to Greenwich Village, you know, half out of my fucking mind, riding this thing on the streets. I don't know how. I never got hit by a car or creamed. You know what I mean? But we did it. That's wild. That's and crazy. they were awesome. 
It was such a blast. It was such a blast. And I got pulled over by a cop once, and he's like, I don't even know what to write you up for. You know, he's like, what the hell is this? You know, he's he, he's just like, don't write it on the street. And, you know, I picked it up and walked away. And as soon as he was gone, I got on the road away. Now they're all electric. Yeah, now they're all electric. That's right. But yeah, this is in the early 90s, late 80s. But yeah, it was a blast. And I remember, this is how, and it was a gasoline engine. Me and my buddies are Formula One fans. And they used to have the U.S. Grand Prix in Phoenix, Arizona. And we took them to Phoenix, Arizona as carry-on baggage. We actually carried the damn things with gasoline in them and put them in the overhead locker of an airplane. <laughs> you know, like if you tried to do that now, they'd arrest you. But I, I remember going, this can't be safe. They're letting me on an airplane with a gasoline engine filled with gas. <laughs> Adam Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you're setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class full-size studio for professional mixing and mastering in stereo or immersive sound, Featuring the XART tweeter and custom DSP onboard processing, the A-Series monitors will perfectly adapt to your studio. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for you with an extended five-year warranty at atomaudio.com. Now, you're in Austin now, and I just realized one of the reasons you might like being there, too. Is it because of the race car of the, the Trek of the Americas is right there? It's Circuit of the Americas is here. It, it, um, of course, the year I moved from Miami was the year that they had their first Formula One Grand Prix. You know, go wow. figure. But wow. it obviously Circuit of Americas, you know, um, is awesome. It, it, it didn't hurt. You know, moving to Austin, had they have a Formula One race here. Um, but I like to refer to it as I raised my standards and married a Texas girl. So. Um, she's from Austin, so when we were dating, I would come here to see her, and I, I just loved the town. You know, to be honest, I mean, yeah. she's awesome. She didn't want to move from Miami. I was just ready for a change, you know, so she, you know, we both agreed that, okay, if we're going to move from Miami, you know, she wanted to move to New York City. I have a house in New Jersey. She wanted to live in Manhattan, and I understand that. So I said, well, how, how about Austin? You know, says because I I I can't live in Manhattan. I said I can live in New Jersey, but I don't want to live in Manhattan. How about Austin? She's like, okay, Austin would be good. So that's what that's where we are. And oddly enough, we were actually married at Circuit of the Americas. Wow. We, we got married there, and we got married at the Rolling Stones concert. So my buddy, cheer, uh, shout out to Dave Natal, who's, who's a dear friend of mine who does front of house for the Stones. Dave is a freaking rock star, one of the greatest live mixes I've ever heard. And so fun to watch, you know, especially when he's mixing the Stones. He also did Jeff Beck, the late Jeff Beck, who's such a tragic loss. Missed that guy. But he did Jeff Beck, and, and uh, he uses these old analog Yamaha consoles, and he's amazing. But Dave was had this huge spot kind of cornered off at his front of house um, for us to kind of, you know, and me and my wedding party to come in and and uh, and do our ceremony there, and we were able to hang there during the show, and uh, and it worked out great. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, Circuit of the Americas. I was there once because, oddly enough, nothing to do with music. I was there for the two thousand. Was it thirteen? Yeah, uh, Bitcoin conference that was there, <laughs> of all places. Yeah. And I saw it. It looks. It's this incredible place. It looks like a giant Hot Wheels. Set. It does. Yeah. It's 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 great place to to, to see if a race, especially a Formula One race, and uh, there's a couple of plot spots that if you get the right grandstand, you can see like seventy percent of the circuit. You know, so we we uh, yeah. I enjoy going there, and I look forward to again to the Grand Prix there this year. And again, I've been a, a huge Formula One fan for most of my life. I used to when I lived on the East Coast, we would always go up to Canada for the race up in Montreal. There's another great circuit. Um, but yeah, awesome. yeah. I remember in Miami, you you had some cool cars there. You had a, a red one and a yellow one, if I remember correctly. Oh God, yeah. I I collected cars for most of my life. 
and it's funny, my, my dream house was always like a house with like a, a six car garage and like a little one bedroom attached to it. You well, know, now you got the big house. Right? Now I got the big house. It's got a seven car garage. And, but I sold all my cars <laughs> <laughs> uh, over, over no. the years. It just, I just, no, I couldn't. It's, I had cars for 33 years, you know, vintage. I was collecting vintage, you know, American muscle cars and I had some real gems and I loved them. And it only took a couple of times of having major issues. Like I had one of them, caught, actually two of them caught fire. Um, and it just, what happened is, you know, at one point I had 14 of them. And at one point it's just like, you can't keep track of which one needed what work, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you know. It's like upkeep. It's like studio upkeep. Yeah. You know, when you're taking out a, you know, I had, I had some real, a nice Shelby Mustang. I had two Shelby Mustangs, you know, but I had a 68 yeah. GT350, you know, and I remember I'm taking it out and I'm take, picking this girl up for a date in it, you know, and like the rear drum brake locked up, you know, I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, just like seized. <laughs> You know, like, you know, and it's embarrassing, you know. Yeah, right, right. You know, but it's a little shit like that. Like, you know, multiply that by 14 cars. It was never ending. So at one point, I'm just like, I'm done with this, you know. So I just drive a crappy old Ford right Explorer on. now and, and happy with it. But <laughs> yeah, I had, I, I, I collected cars for most of my life. Awesome. Well, so now when you left Unique, uh, I know that, I think you were up at Blue Jay Studios in Carlisle as well in Massachusetts at one point, and that's where you were working with Steve. Very good. Yeah. I, yes. I mean, yeah, we did. I started out at Unique Recording, you know, and then after the Winwood albums or after the Winwood High Life, back in the High Life album, you know, and I started getting more work, you know, I was able to go to some of the higher end studios in New York City and fell in love with the hit factory and uh i pretty much started doing a lot of work out of the hit factory you know eddie germano became almost like a father figure to me and his son troy who's my age um you know we hit it off as friends and we just had a blast i loved working at the hit factory and the one thing i loved about working at the hit factory was um you'd go into work and there were four other rooms in the complex you know so like in in the room next to me might have been hauling oats or could be in excess or whoever, you know, Paul Simon or for God's sake, John Lennon was working downstairs, you know, so you always were able to kind of have a relationship with the other engineers that were working there at the time, you know, which is something that doesn't happen anymore when you're working out of a home studio. So yeah, that was good fun. And then um, we went and I was working with this band called the system, David Frank and Mick Murphy. And, uh, they had found this cool studio up in Carlisle, Massachusetts called Blue Jay. You know, okay. You know, and it was a residential. So the studio also had a, a house that was maybe a couple of miles away. And you would stay in this house and then you just drive in and go, go to work. And the studio was built in a bunker. Wow. It was very weird, but it was really cool. It's kind of in the woods. You know, had a great little yard area and barbecue. And it was just a really cool vibe. And I fell in love with it. So... We mixed an album up there for the system. And then I liked that place so much. I, I went back and did a couple of other albums and befriended the assistant that was working with me. The guy's name is Rob Feaster. He was the assistant that worked with me. And we became friends and he ended up moving to New York. And I hooked him up with a, a gig at the Hit Factory. And and uh, we're actually still friends, you know. And he moved to Nashville and then he moved to Australia. And, and then I get a phone call one day and he, was, he, he moved a block away from the studio in Miami Beach. So we, we yes, and we're still friends. He still lives in Miami, but yeah, Blue Jay was a great place. I had an SSL, and yeah, really enjoyed working there. But yeah, it was East Coast, and this is around this was eighties, early late eighties, early nineties. Okay, and then uh, I started doing a lot of work in California while still living in New Jersey. So I decided, let me move to California. Chris was living in California. My brother Jeff was living in California. So let me move out there, you know. So again, I packed up, moved out to Los Angeles. Literally, was there for a week, and I got an album booking in New York City. I was like, son of a bitch! <laughs> of course, I moved to California because I want to live where I'm working, and I got a booking to mix it with Dave Matthews under the table and dreaming. And I wanted to mix it at Power Station in Manhattan. All right, so that's what I did. You know, so I came back and mixed Dave Matthews in New York, and then. Did the rest of my work in uh, in California. 
when we were working together in Miami, I remember you talked about, you know, here you have this great studio to work out of at South Beach and and occasionally bands would be like, we want you to work where we are, you know, and you're like, I got, I want to work where I know, got everything I need for mixing. So I guess that's like, I guess that's always a struggle that people have to deal with figuring out how to, you know, yeah, where, well, where you want to be. Well, look, I know, I know, I knew when I moved to Miami and then I had the, 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 it was my opinion or my feeling that if they, bands wanted the best mixes, they need to come to where I am. Right. You know what I mean? So one of the reasons I moved to Miami, because I saw it as an opportunity for bands. They work their ass off making the records. They work their ass off touring and everything that's going on to mix the record outside of, out of their bubble. You know, so in other words, they're away from the distractions of where they live. They're away from the distractions, you know, their girlfriends, the record companies, everything else. They come to Miami and it's like, okay, we can just focus on mixing. You, you know what I mean? And you have, you just get a break and you can kind of focus on it. So I saw that as a plus, but I knew that there was going to be gigs that I'm, I was going to lose because the bands didn't want to come down. So, and that, you know, I was cool with that. So, and, and one of the things that happened, so I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. You know, the Steve Winwood gig back in the high life, that they hired Chris. Okay. Chris at that point in his life was focusing his energies more towards mixing. He's just starting to just focus on being a mixer. So that was a recording gig, okay? But they had hired him, so Chris pitched me for that. And, and of course, they were cool with it. And the, 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 uh, the agreement was I would record the record, and then Chris would mix the record. And, and that was fine. I worked on that album for roughly eight months, you know, recording it. And as it got close to the mixing, you know, Steve and Russ Teitelman, the producer... We're like, we like what you're doing and we'd like to stay with you, you know? So I spoke to Chris about it and he's, he's like, doesn't matter which Lord Algae mixes it as long as it's Lord Algae, right. <laughs> you know, famous last words, you know, you know, forward a year later, I don't know if he would say the same thing, knowing that that album won best engineered recording Grammy, you know, but he was very proud of me. There was never an issue, you know, and when I won it again in two years for two years later for another Winwood album, you know what I mean? He was very proud of me. There was no issue. But I I always felt a little bad about it because that was Chris's Grammy. And to date, Chris has never received the Best Engineer Recording Grammy. He's the dude that trained me. I don't think that's fair. So, but I always appreciated it. And I've always said that, and you know, without my brother Chris, there would be no me. Like, it, the path would have been quite slu- a lot different. I mean, Chris cleaned toilets, you know, swept floors, so I didn't have to. You know, what I mean, I walked in the studio. I was I assisted him for about a month, and then I did my own sessions. I didn't have to wow. go through the hierarchy of working your way up. Um, all based on my brother's recommendation. So I always appreciated that. So again, my story was so. Now we're in the '90s. I'm working at South Beach Studios, and. I'm higher. I'm I'm six to eight months booked in advance, you know. So I, I had a booking. It's coming close up on it. I get a call from the band. The band's like, "Hey, things have changed, and we can't come to Miami. You know, would you consider mixing the record in Los Angeles?" And I said, "Well, you want my best mixes?" And they said, "Of course we do." And I said, "Well, you need to come to Miami." And they said, "Well, we can't." And I said, "I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy." in Los Angeles. So I recommended my brother, Chris, they went with the recommendation. He mixed the album and he killed it. That's great. That album was Green Day, American Idiot. Wow. And he won his first Grammy on that album. Wasn't a best engineered recording Grammy, but it was his first Grammy award. So I, 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 I remember just feeling a tremendous amount of relief and well, pride in my brother's work and his accomplishment, but just relief that I was able to pay it back you know what i mean Th- that yeah because of my recommendation you know what i mean Th- that this worked out well for him and obviously that was the that was in my opinion that's what set cla on fire you know what i mean like that record that was chris all the way you know like he just fucking nailed it so 
like he killed it. You know what I mean? And then he just ran with it, you know? And and that was really the genesis of of his second part of his career, which is now it just which has created him as probably arguably one of the best mixers in the world. That's great, man. Um, you know, hearing stories of brothers in the same industry like that is such a cool story to hear. You know, one of the, one of the artists you work with, of course, is Hanson. Um, did you find that you were able to connect with those guys just also on the brother, the brother story level? Sure. Yeah, they're, they're an interesting dynamic. I mean, f- I mean, we mentioned Hanson. Of course, everybody just thinks of Umbop, this little bitty, you know, pop tune. Hanson are the keepers of the groove. You know, they do R&B records and their shit is real. It's totally legit. Drums, bass, Hammond, organ, guitar, let's go. And they're awesome. I, I Honestly, I mean, I still work with them, you know, and they're great. They're up in... When I told them I was moving to Oklahoma, they were like, great, now we can come down and mix with you. I mean, when I told them I was moving to Austin, because they right. live in, in, in Oklahoma, which is not far from here, you know, they're like, great, we can, we love Austin. We'll come down next time we mix an album. I'm like, awesome. But Hanson, they've been dear friends of mine. I love those guys. And yeah, they're kind of, it's a similar thing. I see the the dynamic with the three brothers, and you know. Yeah, that's great. Uh, no, no offense to Hanson or anybody in Oklahoma, which of course is also where the Flaming Lips are from. Yeah. But um, my roommate in 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 a grade school or no, in high school was from Texas, and he used to tell me a joke, which is how I know where Oklahoma and Texas are. He said, "What keeps Texas from falling into the Gulf?" And the answer is Oklahoma sucks. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. <laughs> but uh, anyway, now at least I know where everything is. <laughs> if you are mixing music, podcasts, or audio for video, and you want it to sound amazing, then Isotope has got your back. With RX, Ozone, Neoverb, Nectar, and VocalSynth, you'll have a collection of powerful apps and plugins that will help you get a professional sound in no time. Whether you're looking to clean up your vocal recordings with RX, master your tracks with Ozone, or add depth and ambience to your mixes with Neoverb, Isotope is your magic wand for awesomeness. Plus, with Nectar and Vocal Synth, you can easily add creative effects and unique textures to your vocals and instruments. From subtle mix enhancements to extreme sound design, Isotope takes your music and podcast productions to the next level. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the second half of the show, a.k.a. the Jam Session. My guest today is Tom Lord Algy, joining us from his studio in Austin, Texas, Spank Studio. And uh, are you ready to jam, dude? Yeah, man. All right. So... Let me go into, I got a lot of great questions um, for you about making records. We've got questions that are coming from the rock stars and from friends. Um, And I also want to preface this by saying that when I had the pleasure and the, you know, the great opportunity to work with you 20 years ago, I was that that new guy was so green. I was so excited to be in the studio with you. It's like, all I wanted to do was just ask you, what's that? What's that? What are you doing right there, Tom? What's that for? <laughs> and you were, you were really gracious about dealing with that. I, I, was, I, know that I was going to ask you, are you sure I wasn't a douche? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, man? You gave me a t-shirt that said, you have the right to remain silent. So please shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I got a great story about that. Cause um, Lily and the artist we were working with in a trick. So he got it immediately. But I was so green and I was so excited to be in there mixing and learning this stuff. I didn't even get the joke until he pointed it out. <laughs> so, so I really appreciate it. Finally, I have an opportunity where it's appropriate to ask you a bunch of questions. So thanks for doing this with us. Yeah, man. Um, all right. So let me see here. We've got some questions that have come in um, and I'll just jump right in and go through them. So thanks for sending in your questions, Rockstar. Some of these come in from our Facebook group. If you're not there now, please just go to facebook.com and look for Recording Studio Rockstars. Join the group if you want to um, be able to ask questions like this. And then just make sure you answer the three questions so we let you into the group and we know you're not a robot. All right, so this one comes in from Trent Jones. And Trent says, 
I'd love to know anything, everything about mixing Live's Throwing Copper album. The mix is very aggressive, in my opinion, with lots of compression, and it really complements the energy of the music. Lightning Crashes has a dramatic build to the last chorus. I'd love to know how much of those dynamics Tom created in the mix versus what the band captured during tracking. And however you want to answer that, Tom, there certainly can be, you know, that question of like, do dynamics come from the recording side and then get compressed just right? Or do they get kind of also created in the mix side? I think that a lot of the dynamics on that record were, were inherent in the production. Now, my memory, well, first of all, I had an audition for that record, Rats. You know, and I had already mixed some stuff for them in the past. I, I mixed a couple of songs for Mental Jewelry. But they had me audition for that record. I came out, you know, Jerry Harrison, I've been doing work with him. He, he's like, I want you to mix this record. The band wants somebody else. You know, come on out and mix a song and we'll go from there. Obviously, I think I nailed it. <laughs> the first yeah. one we mixed was uh, Selling the Drama. It was mixed in this freaking awesome studio in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. It was in, it, it was, the studio was in this complex that used to be the Playboy Resort. So it was this sprawling resort, massive hotel with the conference center. And in the conference center, they had the studio with an SSL and the studio was great. Now, the Playboy Resort is long gone and the place was slightly decrepit. Um, and they were actually about to either tear it down or renovate it. So we had the run of the place. We were the only ones in the hotel. You know, as a matter of fact, it wasn't even open for business, but the studio was open and we had the run of the place and we went hog wild. I mean, <laughs> we get trashed at night and running down the halls and doing all kinds of wacky shit. Are you riding riding uh, big wheels like um, The Shining? Yeah. We've, tearing up and down We the were probably doing stuff like that, but I, I, I remember it being a lot of fun. But yes, I went out and auditioned. You know, they loved the mix and we mixed the album. The, the recording of the record was, let's just say, not ideal. It, it, it wasn't ideal. Um, so it required a bit of, you know, finessing and, and work. And it was recorded 48-track analog. Um, but the great thing was that particular studio had a great live room. So I set up some speakers and mic'd up the room and I sent a lot of the audio, a lot of the ambience that you hear on that album was the ambient, the audio, the ambience of the room of the recording okay. room. So I like, I sent the drums out to that room. I sent guitars, I sent vocals because it was just a great sounding room. Now that's the second part of Trent's question was uh, wanting to know how you got the snare sounds on the record. They're huge and cracking. Now, is that, is that a cool way to add some more like space around the snare drum is to reamp it in the, in the studio space? Yeah. I mean, I've always been a big fan of chambers and that stuff. So, you know, having the ability to put, send that out to the room and then use that room as kind of your ambience worked out really well. The issue that I had with their, the, the room tracks on the, on the recording is um, Chad Gracie, the drummer, very heavy handed, especially with the hi hat and the cymbals. So it almost make, made the room mics in unusable, you know, because there were so much cymbals and top end information that you never got that nice, rich, you know, bass drum and snare drum room sound. So that's why I just use the, uh, you know, I would just send them out to the, uh, to the room and the mixing. That makes but, a lot yeah, of it sense. Yeah, it, I mean, it was a lot of what I remember was it required. Um, all of my talent to, to get that <laughs> record, you know, because it was, in my opinion, the, the recording was uh, subpar and it, it required a lot of finessing. And then I re remember Jerry Harrison, big technology guy. Yeah, you know, he, he produced, was a member of the Talking Heads, correct? That's right. So he was well into technology and he shows up with this computer, you know, and I'm like, what is that? He's like, this is digital recording. It's called Pro Tools. My first introduction. Wow. You know, so we're going to mix the analog, but we're also going to mix into here. So on lightning crashes, all that amp noise in the beginning of the song is how it was recorded. Uh, I don't know why, but that's just how, that's the recording. Jerry's like, I can get rid of that. I'm like, okay, I'd like to see that. So um, 
he took the guitar, put it through Pro Tools, and got rid of all the amp noise. We, the band and I, listened to it, and, and all of us together felt that, although it technically it sounded better, it had lost the vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the vibe was all that noise, you know, literally just all that noise. And then uh, the recording of that record, on almost every song, there was like three different microphones per, per performance of guitar. You know, so in that particular one, I just I just picked one microphone to start the song with. And then, you know, as it progressed, I would blend in other microphones, you know. And, and yeah, it's just their whole thing is like it, it starts low, you know, and gets loud. So you kind of just finesse it. I was just going to say, it reminds me when we brought the Atrixo album to you. We had, that's where I learned lessons like don't show up at the mix with like four mics on every single guitar overdub for Tom to figure out at the at the mix session, you know. And one of the things you did is you started flipping between them. Then you turned to me, you said, "You notice that these two are just the same guitar in mono right here." And I was like, "Oh man!" So yeah, what do, what uh, what do you want to say to the rock stars about you know multi mic guitars before a mix? What what should we be doing to make it better for? Well, mixer well, like do whatever you look. With, with the multi mic multi microphones on one guitar performance, whatever you got to do to get the sound, okay. But I can tell you that you know, let's just say, let's just use two that use two microphones. I can guarantee you, ninety nine percent of the time, once you balance it, you know, like basically your first balancing of them is always you're never going to change it. You know what I mean? So just bounce it down to one track. Yeah, You know, I mean, it just makes the session tidier or whatever. But yeah, when I get those sessions and I get them daily, you know, I open it up, I listen to it. You know what I mean? And again, 99% of the time, I just go with what their balance was. And I, whether it's two or three microphones, I create a single channel out of it. It just makes session management a lot easier. And again, nowadays, you're able to, you can create another session that has the originals in it, you know, and it can be, placed in on a hard drive somewhere and if you ever needed it wanted to rebalance it or hear what it was like with just the one mic you could always do it but it's like make your master session you know make it manageable yeah that was another lesson i learned from you when we brought in the sessions we had created everything in pro tools so we started out thinking that pro tools was a sidecar in a studio and by the time we were done with that record the whole record was in the computer and we needed to get it over to the tapes for you. And then we, you know, it became this process of reassembling kind of all the tracks with you until it was ready for you to mix. And, and you know, we followed that, you know, we followed your lead on that. But um, that was one of the comments you said. You said, like, like how do I just, I need, I need to be able to just press play and hear this song that you guys have brought me so I even know what I'm going to mix. And again, like, it's just like all these light bulbs were going off, you know, <laughs> at the time. But um, what what do you want to say about that now? When people s deliver mixes today, they probably are in the computer. They're probably all in Pro Tools well, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, 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 they are. And, and so what are some lessons that we need to think about as far as, um, you know, you press play and it's a rough mix in Pro Tools, but it also still needs to be mixable. You need to sort of have both the version that is already dialed in and a clean slate at the same time. So how, how do we do that? When I first started mixing using Pro Tools, I would ask the people to send me the session to take all the plugins out. And, and that would be my starting point. And then I realized that that probably was a mistake, you know, because back in the early, in the early days of Pro Tools, people were still EQing and compressing and doing that stuff into Pro Tools. Now, you know, over the past 10 or 15 years, now what they've done is that they record what I call documents. So basically they just take the microphone, plug it into the preamp and then plug that preamp into Pro Tools. Yeah. And then it's a document. And then all the heavy lifting is done by the plugins. So therefore it's not in, it's not in, in my interest to have them remove the plugins. What I ask them to send me, send me the last rust mix, you know, or the rough mix that you that you like Send me that session, you know, with all the automation and all the plugins, and I'll go through it and I'll sort out what I want to use and what I don't want to use. Nine times out of 10, I scrap anything they did with the drums because they normally suck. 
And, and what I can do with the drum set, you know, is I can make it sound great. You're like, I know what I can do with the drum set. So I don't even bother with, with whatever, you know, unless they've done something that's that I feel is really spectacular. I generally scrap everything from the drum set. And what I do is I when it, I, I'll get their session, I'll scrap the drum set, and then I'll start by mixing the drums and getting the drums mixed and balanced. And then I'll begin to go through the other instruments and, and see what of it, what am I going to use that they've done and what am I not going to use? And again, nine times out of 10, I, I use all the drums, uh, all the bass, guitar and keyboard balances. I pretty much just take them and commit them. You know what I mean? And and that becomes my starting point. So I commit it so that, you know, and then I save the original session of those things if I need to go back and rebalance or do anything. But I do that so that I just have an audio track that has all their moves, all the automation, all the plug-in information. It's just a new audio track with no automation in it. It's That's how it is. And then I treat it as such from there. I would you know, manipulate it from there. It just makes it a lot easier. And then again, if I need to take a step back and redo it, you know, I have this, I, I create a session of that bounce, you know, and I could go back and if I needed to rebalance something or take an effect off or something like that, I would do that. So, and then when it comes to the vocals, then it just depends on what's going on. Because again, nine times out of 10, my vocal chain is going to be a million times better than what they're using, but sometimes what they've done creates a vibe. So it's not out of the realm of acceptability for me to actually take the lead vocal with the effect and just bounce a stereo stem of it and use that for the mix and then put my shit on it afterwards. You know, like, you know, it's I do that all the time or maybe I won't print it with the reverb and I'll run the reverb separate, you know. Right on, right on. So, and, and is that, does that also feel like something that used to happen as well where you, was there already a process of, I feel like I remember you had sort of the console almost like two sides. You'd bring the stuff in and, and work on it and then move it, you know, print it over to the other side of the board. Well, yeah, then, that's so, yeah, back then I used to, I would do that. I would actually, I would, I would run stuff through the console and some of my outboard gear and then print it back into Pro Tools. You know what I mean? Because I've just gotten over the past, you know, 15 years, 20 years, I guess, um, I don't like to run my gear live. If I'm going to use my outboard gear or the console EQ and stuff like that, I just don't print it, you know, especially if I'm doing something that's a lot of that requires that, that, that makes the sound, you know, it's one thing to just put the EQ in and add a touch of, of top end or bottom end or, you know, but if I'm going to gouge something with a lot of compression and, you know, it's in my interest to, to, to print it into Pro Tools yeah. that way. So that it always plays back that way, especially if I have to recall the mix and, you know, do an update to it, then it will always come back. Whereas if, if I had a notate, you know, the, the, the whole thing with the total recall when I was doing analog mixing using all outboard gear, it's the patch cords. Unless you serial numbered the patch cords and, and said I used patch cord number one to go from here to here and then patch cord number two, to, like, and that's a shit ton of work. But what happens is, if you're not using the exact same patch cords, like, you know, there's subtleties that, that get lost. Yeah. So yeah. I just found it was in my interest to just print it. Well, you had a you had an amazing assistant there. Um Femio. Really nice guy. Yeah, Femio. He was great. Yeah. And he and the patch bay was just this forest. He was just he was just like looking up over this forest yes. of patch cables. And and uh when you did a recall, he would get it all ready and you come in and you sit down. And press play, and then you had this one button, and you just flip it, and you listen and see right. you listen for whether it matched perfectly the original, right. the last print right. of the mix. That's right. It was just it was it was quite something. To yeah. See so that. I was using a, a Sony thirty three forty eight tape tape machine, you know, in in concert with in conjunction with Pro Tools, but I would always print the stereo mix, you know, obviously to two channels on the forty eight track, and I would have that come up on an on an on an external to monitor, you know, an aux, so that. You know, in real time, I could just switch to here's the mix that I printed. Here's the live mix, and you just switch them back and forth, and you'd be able to tell right away. Okay, this you know this needs uh, to be looked at. You know, why isn't this sounding right? Right, right. Very cool. All right, I'll keep moving forward. So the next uh, comment comes in from Cheyenne Metters. He says, uh, "Dad used to listen to that record. He's talking about live." Oh, um, I just yes. Oh yeah, my mom just school. loves you guys. 
That's, that's, <laughs> it's the when worst I thing was... you could say to a band. It's like, <laughs> oh, my mom just, I, I, I dated this girl once and I took her to, to see one of the artists I work with. And she meets the band. She goes, oh, my mom just loves you guys. It's the worst fucking thing you can say. So, but go ahead. Yeah, my dad. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think Cheyenne became a fan too. So when I was in eighth grade on cassette in an old Jeep, that's great. If I recall correctly, the second to last chorus in Lightning Crashes actually dipped in volume and then rose back up for the final chorus. And then Trent right. jumps in and says, that's a cool memory. Yeah, there's a lull in the bridge, then a little that's dip right. in the following chorus. Than an explosive finish. Yeah, um, yeah. Right. I mean, it, it designed in the production. Yeah, yeah it kind of. Great. Yeah, it's it's not this. It's just a whole dip in the energy. So yeah, it's this big rise, and then and then it comes way down, probably to just like you know drums, bass, maybe one guitar, you know, and Ed, you know, just singing by himself, and you know, in a, in a in a falsetto voice singing the chorus, and then it builds to this, you know. And you guys were mixing off analog at that point? Still, yeah, yeah, that was, was recorded it was 48 track analog tape that it was recorded on. So yeah, that and because we were mixing in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, I didn't have Sony 3348 with me, so I had to deal with the synchronizing the two machines, which is a huge right. fucking pain in the ass. Yeah, uh, so Rockstars if, if you're not familiar Rockstars, 48 tracks of analog means 224 tracks. 224 track tracks, there. which means Synced. that you have a tape machine that has to synchronize. So it's like, you know, Oh, quick, just rewind. Let me get that bit in the first chorus. Well, you have to rewind halfway into the first verse so that the tape would be synchronized by the time you got to what you needed to make, you know, address. Yeah. Well, at least people would go for it when it was time to record and not phone it in, hopefully. Yeah. No, but it was, yeah, it was, but yeah, it was all analog and we mixed the you know, half inch analog, 30 IPS. All right. So um, let's see. Here's a, here's a comment that comes in from Crispy Crispy. Uh, his path to two bus processing. So I think they, I think he means, what do you want to say about um, your stereo bus processing? Or just what tips do you want to give for that? I keep it simple. So all I use in the two, I mean, I just use, to be honest, I just use my, uh, the console compressor. You know, this console has a, a quad compressor built in because mm -hmm. it's a quad console. So it's quad meaning four outputs. So left, right, I'm sorry, left right yeah left front yeah. right front left rear right rear you know for some reason they kept building quad consoles even after the 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 quad you know went defunct in the 70s right but um but i like it in quad because like when i come to print stems i can print two sets of stems at once because again left right left rear you know right left right rear left right front yeah yeah, yeah. Um, like so it's a quad compressor uh, but that's all i use I don't use an equalization or anything like that. I do all my heavy lifting on the individual channels and get them all to sound as great as possible. And then this is the glue. This is just, you know, right the, the compressor I use here just to just to pull everything together. But all the heavy lifting is done everywhere else. So, you know, I mean, look, there's, there's no right or wrong way to do it. But generally speaking, when I look at your master fader, if I see seven plugins in there, you know, I, I basically know what type of mixer you are. <laughs> right, you know, like right. if, if to me, you know, your master fader should have one or two plugins. You know, it should have a compressor and then a limiter just to to, to hold the peaks. You know, the transients. You know, so that yeah. that limiter is only there to, so that you can get the mix to be modern standard loud. Okay. Do you miss so, printing to analog tape, or are you still printing no, to analog tape? No, I don't. I, I don't miss it. I don't miss it. I'm. I've. I, I, uh, I love analog. I love what it does, but I also think that digital is even better. So, I mean, in other words, digital is just, I don't have, now I don't have to worry about generations. So, I mean, I remember recording analog albums, you know, and you had to be aware of, you know, when you're making a vocal comp, okay, this is going to be now one generation less, you know, like, you know, it's going to be a generation. It adds a generation of recording, you know, and when you get to two and three generations from the original recording, it starts to get noisy and you run into issues. So, yeah. Um, and when you were mixing an album like live with all the dynamic range, does that also present challenges as far as just keeping the tape hiss under control and, and hell yeah. get addressed in the mix? Yes, of course. You know, I mean, I don't have to think about that anymore. 
you know, now now it's checking the plugins to make sure they have the analog turned off. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Because all the analog modeling is is adding noise. That's all. That, just just so you know out there, you know, what I mean, on almost all plugins, if it says analog, all it's doing is adding noise. It's the modeling for the noise from the analog. Like that's the whole reason that we came with digital was to get rid of the analog noise. You know, so yeah. yes, it's great that you have these plugins that are modeled after analog equipment, but we don't want, I don't need the noise. So, but the good news is that most of the manufacturers have now defaulted it to off. You know, right, but back right in the on. day, you know, it was defaulted to on, you know, so. Yeah, I've gotten burned on a few print, printed mixes that way. I was like, where did all this noise come from? Yeah. I go back and find it finally. <laughs> OWC is your one-stop shop for flexible drive storage and connectivity solutions for your studio. The MiniStack STX for your Mac Mini adds two additional drives over a universal SATA HDD SSD bay and an NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD, plus three additional Thunderbolt USB-C ports. The OWC Thunder Bay 4 chassis, built like a tank, gives you four hot-swappable 2.5-inch RAID configurable drive bays plus an extra Thunderbolt 3 jack for daisy chaining up to five devices. Or check out the OWC Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock with two RAID configurable drives and seven ports of connectivity, including a front side SD card reader, one gig Ethernet, two USB 3.2 ports, a dedicated display port, and an additional backward compatible Thunderbolt port. Get your studio connected with the mini stack. STX, Thunder Bay 4, and Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Use the custom link in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. All right. So this next question is from Joe, Joey Craig. Um, says, uh, tricks on how Tom makes a chorus bigger. He has a way of building to peak song points that I love. So what do you want to share about making sure the chorus has a lift and is, and is bigger. Yeah. You just want it. I mean, could be as simple as, as, you know, your verse, if you have left, right verse guitars, you know, pan them at 60, 60, you know, and then when the chorus comes in, pan those hundred percent each, you know, left, right. So that expands. The other thing that I like to do is, is uh, if there's not three guitars in the chorus, I'll create a third guitar you know, to distort third distort, distorted guitar and, you know, really make it super distorted and honky. You know what I mean? And just run that one up the center, you know, and, and that kind of helps to expand the choruses as well. But yeah, that's a great tip. Stuff like that. You know, and also could, could also be turn the drums up. <laughs> you know, give the, yeah. usually that's what I do is just give the drums a DB or two boost in the chorus. Um, are there, I mean, I remember some learning some cool widening tricks from you too. So for example, if we had a sound that was sort of mono or it was a guitar that was off to one side and you wanted it to be a little bit bigger, you would send it over to the PCM 42 and add a short delay on it and then pan that to the other side. And then, you know, I was like, wow, man, that's cool. You know? Yeah, no, there's this, yeah, all the, all kinds of tricks like that, you know? Yeah. Still, still do that. Right on, right on. Um, what about um, other widening effects for guitars? Are there any things we might want to just look at? Are there, um, you know, I, I seem to recall there's like the H3000 effect that kind of widens out guitars. <laughs> right, just yeah. Stuff so, like that, whatever you got. Yeah, so I used to do, I haven't done it in a while because now there's there's plugins that actually allow you to 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 either adjust the volume of the center or the, 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 you know, the sides. Yeah. But I used to do this thing with the H3000. There, there was a, a setting that I had in the H3000. If I put a, a mono guitar in it, what it did, it took the center out. And now the guitar only comes out the sides. So an example of that can be heard on the intro to Lakini's Juice, which is on the next album by Live called Secret Samani. So it, it has this guitar that starts the song. And that's going through that effect. Okay, so there's no guitar in the center. It's just to the sides. And then I actually print that effect because what I have to do to get that effect to, to there's a, a modulation wheel that I actually have to turn. And, and I did it when I recorded it, you know, when I put it through the effect and then recorded it back to digital tape. I, I 
move this modulation wheel. So if you actually play that intro in mono, you can actually hear it phases a little bit, like or oh, flanges ever so slightly when you play it in mono. But when you play it in stereo, it's glorious because the center is just gone. You yeah. know? So, and that was an effect I, I used quite a bit. And it's, it's in the H3000. I forget what it's called. And I haven't used it in a while, you know, because again, I'm able to, to achieve a similar effect with plugins. Like, so SSL updated their channel strip two plugin, which is the SSL 4,000 channel strip or 9,000 channel strip. And now they have this wide button on it, you know, that, or, you know, or a width button that you can actually just dial in a little bit more of the sides. It brings up the volume of the sides, um, you know, and now it's variable versus the original SSL stereo channel. It only had, when you hit extra wide, it just became, it removed the center, but it was almost like out of phase, you know, right. and that, an example of that would be in the Waves EV2 plugin. When you hit extra, you can only hit extra wide and it does this real big width thing. What SSL did on their native ch channel strip two is mm -hmm. give you the ability to now dial in the amount of width. It can also be done with the the Vitalizer, the SPL plugin called the Vitalizer by adding again the stereo width. You know, so so again, some of those things by just pulling out, you know, le left and right, you know, by raising the volume of the left and right information on an individual instrument can also help to expand it because it pulls it out of that kind of glue of everything. You know, it just it just gives a little bit more space in the track. That's cool. That's cool. That reminds me when you were mixing the Atrixo album, there was, a, I think there was one of the songs had a bridge that you did a lot of really cool creative stuff. Like you, you put a flange in there and then you started talking to us. You basically educated us on where flanging came from. So uh, tell a little bit about that story. It had something to do <laughs> Wait, with where you, did you flanging two, come from? I'd like to hear this. Well, you, you were telling stories about what you used to do with two turntables. Oh yeah. Your, well, that's how I learned how to do it. Right. And so going back to where we started our conversation, you know, with Chris and, and my brother, Jeff Stereo, you know, they showed me, you know, it's like, check this out. If we play two records the, at the same time, the same, you know, and then just slightly vary speed one back and forth, you get this really cool flanging effect. So that's where I learned it. So I would practice it on the turntables. When I got into the studio, you know, I realized you could do the same thing, you know, by printing, printing it, you know, printing the mix and flying it back in you know, slightly very speeding it. So I got really good at doing that. And then I took it to the next level where it's like, okay, now let's, let me just print here are the instruments that I want to flange. So like, I don't want the bass drum or the bass to flange because the, the bottom end falls out. So I, I would create, here's the section that I want to flange. And I would make sure I had like 24 bars before it because it takes a second for you to, to get it to speed and get everything going, you know? And then the section that I want to flange, here are the instruments, the only the instruments I want to flange. I mean, and then I, you fly that back in and slightly very speed it. Now, again, there's a, there's a modern take on that for those that don't have analog tape. So you do the same thing, except you print it to a track in your DAW, and then you would use the Eventide Precision Time Align plugin, okay, which allows you to go pre or post. Okay, so in other words, you can adjust it so it's either earlier or later using the plugin, and you can automate it, and and there's your workaround, and that's how I do the modern version now. You know, that's so again, great. I generally don't, I don't like to have bottom end information in the flange track because again, the bottom end just disappears. But you know, especially with like screaming guitars that are just sustained, it just creates a great great jet effect. You know, and again, a great example of 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 the old school analog flanging could be heard on some 41 fat lip, which is at the, the end of the bridge. There's a big bill there. Um, it's the abortion part. There's a big delay and a big, uh, uh, you know, thing happening there. And it's just a full track flange. That's great. I'm all right. I'm looking forward to hearing that rock stars. We have a playlist put together of Tom's, uh, extensive discography. I'm sure it's not everything, but it's a lot of cool stuff. So you can go listen to any of those. Just look for the link in the show notes and, and go listen right now and you can hear those examples. Um, all right, so here's another question. This one comes in from Megan Gohill. Megan says, um, when Tom mixes, how does he organize his mix workflow? Does he have a standard method of setting up his tracks? Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, my sessions all look the same. 
So in other words, I mix top from top to bottom and I mix from my console left to right. So my drums are on my left side. So basically when I'm, when I'm working, I want what I call the meat and potatoes, which would be guitars and the vocals. I want them to be at the closest point to where I'm sitting. So my, my meat and potatoes area ranges from channel 17 on my console to channel 32. So those are usually all the main things, the guitars and then the vocals. So I try to set the Pro Tools session up in a similar manner where my percussion tracks are at the top and they show up on my, my channels one through four on the console. So they're at the top of the session. Then my drums are on channels five to 14, right? And they would be the next in line, you know, again, corresponding to where I put them on the console. And then the next would be the bass on 15 and 16. And then the guitar is on 17 to 24. So the session is, is actually laid out. The Pro Tools session is laid out like the recording or like it's coming up on the console. Then my vocals on 25 to 32, all the vocals. And then the keyboards and the other extraneous in instruments on 33 up. So that, that would be how the session works out. But what I found recently, what I'm doing is, is I do all the instrumentation and then, then I put all the vocals at the bottom of the session just to keep all the instrumentation together. But yeah. yeah. And then the other thing, most importantly, is I relabel the stuff so it's not in hieroglyphics. Because I, what is with hieroglyphics, people? Um, <laughs> hello? You know, like you take all this time to, to, to craft and generate these great sounds and great performances, and then you label it like in some obscure manner that nobody in, in their right mind can figure out, except you. You know, like... At what point did you think guitar strat dot dupe dot cm dot o one <laughs> was acceptable? You know, like you spend all this time, but you spend zero time making it so you can navigate and quickly look and go, oh, that's the chorus guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Rock stars, take your session, make it really simple to understand what's in there. And please make it so that Tom can just press play and at least hear the damn song when he starts mixing. Yeah, and, and the vocal should be labeled vocal, lead vocal, you know, lead vocal double or vocal double, whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see here. This one comes in from Brian Murphy. And Brian says, he's got a few, few parts, but the first is, um, what are some of his best tendencies for getting a great pop in a snare drum? Compression. <laughs> nice. And do you find that the SSL onboard compression is like, how often do you find that's the compressor that you reach for on a channel versus outboard stuff? I use plugins. I just use the plugins. So um, for a snare drum, you know, the arouser is brilliant. Yeah. You know, shout out to you, Dave. Yeah. He did a great job with it. I love that one. Um, to be honest, I mean, I use the SSL channel strip, you know, plugin, whether it be the SSL version, but lately I've been using the, the Waves EV2, you know, and again, I like that one as well on the snare drum. Um, yeah, it's really dependent on the, the, the recording, you know, so it depends on the recording, but yeah, it's just about, you know, e I EQ into compression. You know, I see a lot of sessions where the guy are compressing first and then EQing. That's all fine and dandy, but I figure I'm, you know, I'm trying to create a new sound. I want the compression to be with that equalizer, you know, right. going into right. it. So that I think is the key, in my opinion. So now, um, you know, you you have a long history working on the 4000 console. You're, you're, you've got the Origin console going as well, which I think is like, it's it's like a hybrid of if I recall, does the orange the origin does not have automation on it? So it has no automation not, and no dynamics. So it doesn't have the compressors or gates built in. Right. So it's acknowledging that a lot of that stuff is taking place inside Pro Tools. Correct. Right? Correct. But it and is then, a solid console. Yeah. It's solid. It's and, a good sounding console. And very um um upgradable, like modifiable, right? Ooh. You can put uh you can put controllers in the front. The oh, yeah, yeah, side. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I got the, the SSL controller and yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it's, you find, uh, are you using the UF8 and the UC1 at all in, a, in your workflow yet? In, in that room, yeah. So those are those are in the origin room. I have both of them and I use them in the origin room. Uh, down here, I don't need them. 
So the so for example, using the channel strip two plugin and the UC one controller, it's like you've got you've got the same stuff you would see on a board. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I would like to see SSL make it so that any of the SSL licensed plugins can operate through that device. Right, As, right, right. now, it's only the SSL made plugins. Right. On. You know, but it is. Yeah, the thing is cool as shit. Yeah, I, I put that into my studio recently, and I'm having a lot of fun. It's awesome. Using it, so. It makes it fun to, um, you know, to not have to look up at a screen. Just, just listen. Yeah. Start, start getting into the music and not have to wonder where something is. That's right. You know. Um, all right. So the next question from Brian, he says, "How does he feel about the latest trends in spatial audio, and does he feel like it could bring a demise to larger consoles?" And uh, that that question also comes in if I can find it quick enough from Colt Caprin saying, "You know, are you doing Atmos mixes?" And is that most truly going to be the future? Aren't you glad that you're the one responsible for answering that question, Tom? <laughs> so I was just kind of hoping it would all go away. I'm not going to lie. It's yeah. a huge fucking pain in the ass. And what I feel, Let me give. Let me tell a story about it. So, sure. my brother Chris, who's <laughs> he was fucking brilliant. My brother Chris jumped in the Atmos with, with both feet, and you know he has a much bigger control room than I have. And he put in a, a, a just a, he and Alan Sides developed put together this Atmos system that's in freaking credible. I went there. He Chris played me Boulevard of Broken Dreams that he mixed in Atmos. And it was, it was probably one of the most amazing things I ever heard. And I just said to Chris, after I was done playing it, I, I complimented him on, on how great it sounded. And I said, it's a damn shame that nobody's ever going to hear it this way. Because Chris's rig is all calibrated and it's done through speakers. And it sounds yeah. incredible. And like everybody in the world should go to his, should book him just so he can hear Boulevard of Broken Dreams and Atmos on that rig because it's never going to sound that great anywhere else. Cause most people are going to be listening through AirPods, you know what I mean? And through AirPods, it sounds like ass, you know, or if they do put together a system, it's probably not going to be calibrated correctly. So it's, it's a, it's a nightmare. So right. I'm all for it. I'm all for this, the, that mixing. I mean, again, when I was able to get this console and put it in my house, you know, when we wired it up, I wired the room up for quad. So I have, you know, poor man surround because my console can do quad. And again, you know, late nights, you know, when I have guests over or, or whatever, you know, I'll put on some Genesis surround, you know, old Genesis from the 70s nice. surround records or, you know, dark a buddy of, of mine gave me Dark Side of the Moon and quad. Yeah. It's I great. have the quad mixes of it and it's, it's life changing. Dark Side of the Moon, you've heard a million times. And when you hear it in quad, it's like hearing it for the first time again. Yeah. Because now it's, you know, and when I bring people in, friends in, and I go, here's stereo and here's quad. And you see the look on their face. I'm, wow, why didn't this take off? You know, so so the, the, the Atmos is, is very similar. But again, because there's no, you know, like the it's... The calibration and getting the speakers and the placement becomes a huge pain in the ass. It's like, oh boy. Now, the other thing was, how the hell do you send a ref to an artist? Here, here's your Atmos, you know. And and then got to come mix with you again, right? Correct. So, <laughs> so it's not going away. I'm embracing it. I am in the process again of turning that now. So the, the my my origin room was my stereo mixing room until this room got up and running. But my plan has always been that that will be my Atmos room. So, you know, people want Atmos mixes. They want them delivered. And from a mixer's point of view, you know, I, I monetize that. So in other words, I, I'll get paid to do to to deliver an Atmos mix. I mean, obviously it's not the same amount that I get paid to deliver stereo mix, but I take the stereo mix and I would bring it up to my Atmos room and then, you know, render it in, in, in Atmos. And but I'd be able to, to monetize that, get paid for my time, basically. So 
you know, it's not going away and they want it delivered that way. And at least, because I've heard mixes that, that I've done that they sent out for somebody else to do Atmos and it doesn't even fucking resemble my mix. Right. So that's what I'm trying to avoid. So, well, they're not, I, I feel like they're not fair comparisons when, because a lot of people talk about the stereo mix or like the remixing of old albums. But, um, but I am curious to see what happens when people start creating in the new thing. But you make, you make a great point, which is if you now, can't listen what to I it, think is, would be really cool, you know, knowing that you're going to have to do your album in Atmos is make stereo the second choice. So in other words, make your production an Atmos production, you know what I mean? And then tailor it to stereo later. Like that I right. see, would see could be really cool. Do the other way. Right. In other words, the, right. Because right now Atmos is the afterthought. So right. make stereo the afterthought, you know what I mean? So, And then call Tom and he'll show you what a really great mix sounds Correct. like in stereo. Then get a mix that you think sounds good and I'll blow it away. The other thing with Atmos... And I also feel this way about Surround. Surround, I think, missed the boat because they didn't tap into car audio. I think car audio, it's you're in a perfect environment for Surround or Atmos. Right, controlled. Right. Yeah. Like, that's the perfect place to have your uh, an Atmos rig, you know, a monitoring rig is in your car. Everybody's got the same stereo with the same setup and the same alignment. Correct. Well, because that, uh, that's right, Tesla. because that can be controlled. Yeah. So, but it's not going away. So, you know, again, my brother Chris just dove right in, you know, and I'm in the process of doing that. And, you know, it's, I, I look forward to it. I know, that, you know, it will be a pain in the ass until I get my he head around it, you know, but once I do, it should be fun. That's going to sound great. Yeah. <laughs> Audio introduces the all-new A-Series line of monitors, featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, built-in DSP-based room correction, and speaker voicings, allowing you to customize your Atom Audio monitors to your control room. The A-Series will rock in any studio. Small studio spaces or immersive multi-speaker configurations are perfect for the A4V or the new A7V, the next generation of the incredibly popular A7X. Mid-sized rooms and narrow spaces will love the low-profile A44H, expanding on the A7V sound, or the A77H, a true three-way midfield monitor delivering rich, spacious sound. And bigger studios will love the A8H, a three-way speaker and the pinnacle of the A-Series that delivers extremely accurate sound required for critical listening environments. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for your studio with an extended five-year warranty at atomaudio.com. Um, you know, I, I sort of picture the traditional movie theater where you had a an organist who would come in and play this big elaborate organ during the old silent films. How about that? How about you create mix rooms like, you know, Tom's mix room is like a big movie theater experience and, and you just fill the audience right there in the perfect setting and we get to listen to you mix a record in real time. That, that'd be, <laughs> why, instead of going out to the movies, you know? Yeah, right. It's like watching grass right. grow. <laughs> <laughs> Except, Rockstars, when you go watch Tom Mix, um, try to be quiet. <laughs> um, all right, so another question for Brian. He says, do artists that um, he works with today seem more or less tweaky and demanding? In other words, do you feel like modern mixes are recalled more or less often than back in the 90s? No, it's it's the same. He's, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't notice a huge difference, you know, it's so some artists I'd like to say have more knowledge, you know what I mean? So they're a little bit more particular in, in what they're looking for, which is fine. You know, because at the end of the day, my job is to make the artist happy, you know? So, but I, I don't notice a huge difference, you know, in, in whether it today or, you know, obviously the things I get asked for things that I wasn't being asked for 20 years ago. You know, because now everybody's so used to just having 
all the choices all the time. You know, so it's like, you know, you know, can you distort the bass? Well, of course I can distort the bass. You know, you know, that that type of stuff, you know. So yeah. but yeah, not I don't see it it's it's not that it's more more now than it, it was in the past. Do you use any of these um new tools for exporting alternate mixes and stems like Andrew Shep's um bounce factory plugin or any of that kind of stuff? No, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. That that's part of the sound flow package, which is a whole nother topic. But um all right, so let's see. Here's another one from Brian. He says, um, what is one tool used in mixing that you feel like every young mix engineer should start with? A reference point. Yeah. Actually, that brings up another question, which I'll jump over to also. Yeah. You, you, you want to become a great mixer? Start, you know, find a song that you really like that you think sounds great and use that as your reference point. And, and every day when you go in the studio, that's the first thing you listen to. You know, and then again, if you question what you're doing, you just put that on and flip back and forth between that song, which is your reference point. So what what your reference point is, is you're referencing top end, bottom end level. You know what I mean? Your EQ curve, you know, and how that song is reacting to the monitoring that you're listening to in, in the particular studio that you're in at that time. So I always used to use Pour Some Sugar On Me by Def Leppard. You know what I mean? Because in the in the 90s, 80s and 90s, I used to travel to a lot of studios. You know what I mean? So every room sounded different. So you had to have something that was consistent, you know, and that was my reference point. So I would put that on, listen to it, listen to what the room is doing and how it's affecting, you know, how, how, it, how it hits me and out of those monitors, and, and then I'd run with it. But yeah, start with a great reference point. So pick a song that you know sounds great. Use that as your reference point. That's great. That's great advice. Um, that, and that is part of the question from Kevin Ward asking about that. But then he said, um, what song do you listen to now to get ready for mixing? I still use pour some sugar on me. Nice. You know, (laughs) I also like to use, um, I I don't like to use my mixes. That's, uh, that's interesting to hear. Yeah. So what do we want to take away from that? Why would be, why would we listen to other people's mixes rather than our own as a reference? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I just don't, I don't like to use my mixes. You know, I mean, it it doesn't mean I haven't in the past. So, so again, like when, when, when I did the shakedown of, this is a new room that I'm in, Spank Studios, two, two or three months old. You know, when I did the shakedown, you know, in other words, when I, the first time I played audio through the speakers, you know, I started with, you know, Def Leppard and then I went through a list of other things you know, and then I started to listen to my own stuff, you know, to see how it translated. So, but generally speaking, I just, because I'm too familiar with my stuff. So I was going to say, yeah, Def Leppard pours some sugar on me. It's great for top end and bottom end. And then another record is Corn Here to Stay. Another one great with top end and bottom end, heavy, aggressive, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, and then if if I was going to use, you know, one of the ones of one of that one ones of mine that I use as a reference would be um, "Dropping Anchor" by Jimmy's Chicken Shack. It was on the pushing the Salmonella Envelope album, one of my favorite albums of, of, of band I mixed. Um, I really always liked the I loved the way that record sounded. And then another one of my mixes that I referenced would be "One Headlight" by the Wallflowers. Right on. I think I remember um, Jimmy's Chicken Shack. That was one of the CDs that was sitting right in the control room when we were making. Yeah, probably so. I mean, I love to listen to it. Love that band. Love that record. You know, it. I mix that record at a time. Sometimes when I'm having a tough day, I'll just put that record on. You know, to kind of try and influence me to get back to whatever my headspace was when I was mixing that, because whatever I was doing, I was making right decisions and all that stuff. Like. You know, and I listen to that record and it inspires me again, so, which is good. Awesome. Well, let me keep jumping forward because um, people are dying to know what you think about things. So, Chris Salim, uh, Billy Decker, and Bobby O. Hey, Billy, thanks for the, the drum samples. I have some of Billy's oh. drum samples. Oh, right you know, on. Actually, right some, on. They're pr- some of them are pretty good. Billy's awesome. He's been a guest on the show a couple of times. Um, and uh, I got another question follow up here in a minute about drum samples. So, basically, their shared question was, how long does it take you to mix a song? 
And um, do you use a template? And how has that template changed over the years? I don't use a template. It makes every song as an individual. Um, you know, so yeah, there's there's no template. Um, there's certain things that I do in every mix. Um, but I just found like when I try to use a template, it's like I, I always felt like I'm handcuffing myself because every mix I do is different. You know what I mean? So I don't use the same effects and I don't want to use the same effects. Um, how long does it take me to mix a song? You know, if you had asked me that question 20 years ago, before Pro Tools or 25 years ago, I would have told you, oh, about four hours. You know, <laughs> you know but now about a day, you know, one day, one song. Summer, <laughs> Don't you love how com computers sped everything up? Yeah, and, right. Yeah, not. And, in quotes. Yeah, but I, th I feel that my mixing is a lot better, you know, and it's by design. Like, in other words, you know, I mean, the way that I mix and how I mix, you know, I set myself up for success. So... Yes, some of the things that I do are time consuming, but they only need to be done once and then they're there forever. Yeah. You know, like my drum triggering, you know, so to create the drum trigger tracks, it's a huge pain in the ass and it takes a minute to do. But once you've done it and you've confirmed it, it's there forever. And then I could right. just run through every sample in the universe if I needed to, knowing that it will trigger every hit phase locked 100% of the time. You know, an example, this, this, what I have on the console now didn't have a drum trigger track. The guy just put trigger two, Stephen Slate trigger two on the snare track. And I'm looking at the snare track going, what are all these edits in the snare track? You know, there are all these edits to get rid of the leakage, you know, and, and clip gains going up and down. You know what I mean? Like he actually had it on the insert of the snare track and used the mix button. So he added a sample in with the live snare and then to had all these wacky edits that I had, it was a nightmare to undo, but I undid it so I could get just the raw snare back again. Yeah. that That's a good example of the wrong way to do it. You know, you create a trigger track, right? Super, super easy. If you don't know how to do it, I know that I've talked about it in some of my videos that are up there on YouTube somewhere um, that, that show you about why I do it. Um, but yeah, so that so that's something that takes time, and and again, we have become the um, audio police or audio maids. I'm sorry, not audio police. Mixing engineers are now audio police as well, or audio maids as well. So I have to listen to every track all the way through for bad edits. You know, I mean? guys, when you're editing anything with bottom end information, make sure you put a fade in the, on on the edits. Otherwise, it will leave a digital pop. Yeah. You know what I mean? And drums and tom-toms included. Okay, not just bass guitars. But pretty much anything. Make sure you put a fade and you'd be surprised how many people don't and how many times they come in and they're just tracks, just tick, 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 you know, digital clicks. Um, so, you know, so that needs to be sorted out. And then, then you have to deal with, you know, what, what we're all dealing with. You know, back in the, in the, in the early parts of, of audio recording, we were trying to recover transients with analog tape. You tried to recover the transients, hence why the attack times for so many compressors of older compressors are slower than modern ones, because you're trying to recreate the transients that got lost in the recording to analog tape. Now with digital recording, we're doing the exact opposite. We're trying to reduce the transients, so. Interesting, because they don't get soaked up by the tape. Correct, correct. But the, again, the great news is the plugins have gotten better. Yeah, you know, so all the plugins yeah. have gotten better, and and I love the fact that the Universal Audio now has native plugins. You know, I mean, I have the 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 uh, the Octo, whatever they call it, the Apollo. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. to whatever the boxes that you need to run the yeah. Universal Audio, but it's even better now. I even use the plugins twice as much because you can just run them natively, and uh, the Studio Multitrack is a great, you know, is a is a great um, plugin. That, that works to, that will help warm up your track, you know, and also reduce some harsh um, transients. Okay, very cool. Um, oh, when it comes to working natively, do you have anything you want to say about what kind of computer we need if we really want to mix effectively? Yeah, one that works. One that works. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends, like, you know, look, I'm just so sick and tired of giving Apple all my money. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I thought 
two or three years ago, I was buying my last computer for the studio, you know, but then I had, a, you know, but no, then, then it's not, you know, at some point there, it, it won't be, uh, you know, what Apple does is they, they don't include that model in the update for heart for software, you know, the, the operating system, you know? So yeah, when you have to drop 10 grand on a Mac pro, it, it hurts, you know, but mm -hmm. for what I need, you know, I have to have that, mm -hmm. but you know, get the computer that's within your budget. And, and the, the, the only suggestion I can make is whatever amount of RAM you think you need, double it. And then whatever hard drive space you think you need, quadruple it. You know, nobody should be buying a computer today that doesn't have a four terabyte hard drive in it, in my opinion. I mean, because now with the, back of that, back in the day, we used to be able yeah. to swap oh, out yeah. the hard drives with ease. Okay, but now it's become a nightmare. You know what I mean? So especially with laptops, you can't even swap the hard drive. So don't chintz out. If you can, if you have a computer that you can manually swap out your hard drive, then then and your RAM, then yeah, then then chintz out and and insert it later. But the modern computers, you can't do that anymore. So yeah, I guess unless you're you know, you're just dealing with external drives and all that kind of stuff. But I, it's, I agree it becomes with you. a horror story. I mean. I, I think I have, just give me a second. I'll count how many hard drives. So I have my main hard drive. Yeah. Then I have a PCIe four terabyte hard drive. So there's, there's two main hard drives. Then I'm running externally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hard drives. <laughs> you know, because there's one that I, so I have one that's called the work drive, right? It's a solid state drive. That's where I do all my work. Then when the mix is done and I'm ready to print, that gets copied, you know, by not copied by dragging. Copy. I take Pro Tools, save a copy in. I create a new session with, you know, where it copies the audio files to another hard drive, which is called the mix drive. That's where the final mix gets put on and laid down. And then once it's mixed, then it, that also now gets saved as a copy onto another hard drive, which is called session storage, right? Then there's what I, then there's a drive that I have called original session storage drive, which are all the variations of what got me to the final version get stored on that. And again, they're all two and four terabyte drives. And then there's the, you know, 16 terabyte drive. That's the backup of everything. Yeah, and then you also must have the challenge that I know, uh, cert, you know, certain professional mixers have where you can or can't use cloud storage, all that kind of stuff. It can get tricky because of I don't use any cloud storage. All my data is here on hard drives, and it's um, redundant. I, so again, it's all redundant. So if my if my mix drive crashes or which I've had before, where I've had a hard drive pack up. You know what I mean? All the data that was on it is on another drive. Not to mention, not only is it on another drive, it's also on my 16 gigabyte or terabyte time machine backup. Right. I'm glad to hear you're using time machine. I'm using that too now. I feel like that's one of the ones that just does its thing. Yeah. I mean, basically, I just calculated all the amount of space I have in hard drives and then made sure I got a drive large enough to, to cover all the data if they were all full. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you I dropped a drive on the floor one time and, and it packed up. You know, luckily, it had just finished backing up. Are you using any of the OWC stuff? That yeah, that's the, the, the four terabyte internal PCIe one is the OWC. Great, great, great. You know, that really just get used when I'm mixing uh, to video. You know, video, you know, so I'll put it on that drive because it's the fastest drive. Um, okay, so one comment I, w I remember you saying about uh, drum triggers when I worked with you, as you said, you used to search through a million samples looking for the right one, and then one day you said, screw it, I'm just going to go make my own from the drum set on this particular album, you know, find a clip and make your own samples. Is that still a thing that you find useful to do? All the time. All the time. You only need, you know, well, guys, you know, guys that are slick, and I get more and more of it. I used to just get it with the Japanese recordings. I do a lot of Japanese stuff making good rock music in Japan. Um, the Japanese recordings at the end of their take would be drum hits. You know what I mean? So I'd be like, snare room, no problem. You know what I mean? There's Here's five hits of the snare drum through, you know, 
and, and I'd be able to, to do that. And it was also great for Tom Toms, you know, cause you'd have the Tom hit. And then, you know, if you get to a spot where the cymbals are really bashing and it's just bleeding through when he hits the Tom, you just drop the sample in there. Yeah. So yeah, I still do it. Okay, cool. Um, you have, you got a minute for a couple more questions? Yeah. All right, dude, we're psyched to have you here. Thank you. Um, so this one comes in from Joe Gilder. Joe said, uh, first he said, that's so cool that you're here on the show. And then he said, how about, what's a common mistake you see in tracks people send to you? I know you've been sharing a bunch, but are there any things we forgot to ask you about? Yeah, most importantly is the common mistake. So I'm, I just finished mixing an album for a band. I'm not going to say the name of the band because I don't want to embarrass them. They used a tuning program. They, they, they happen to use Waves tuning program. It doesn't matter which one you used. But how they used it, they just used the bypass. They automated bypass for the, when they wanted it in tune. The problem with doing it that way is every time it turned on, it created a bump in the audio, a click. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, fuck. And they and didn't render it. that's not something it. you can clean up. Right. And they, so the, and they didn't render it. So... After I did the first mix and I realized what was happening, I had to go back and redo the vocal. And all I did was I du duplicated the vocal, followed their automation, and just created a second track that had the the tuner the tuning on all the time and pulled down the regions that needed that they had set up for tuning. So right, the most important sense. thing, in my opinion, is that you render your tuning. Tuning your tuner should always be the first thing. If you're using a tuning plugin, it should be the first one in there. Okay, so it goes, the first plug in a hit should be the uh, auto-tune or whatever you're using to tune. You know, once you have it worked out the way you want it, render it. You know, commit it. You can just, you know, you can just right-click that plugin and it will just render that plugin only, create a new track with that rendered. Done. Yeah. I can see how an artist might use the bypass. The guys that I was working under the first time they got that, that's what they did. Yeah. Because a lot of times artists are like, I don't want to have to fucking learn how to do this tuning thing. I just wanted a few notes tuned. But that's a clever way to uh, to fix it is just render it. What I do, how I do it, I just use the audio suite. So in other words, I'll have the tuner on, on you know, generally I'm just fixing bits and pieces. You, you know what I mean? So I'm not tuning the whole track. And if, unless I have to tune the If I have to tune the whole track, then I'll just put the plug-in in. But if I'm just doing the odd words here and there, I'll have the plug-in in the first position, right? Make sure that, that the, the setting that I'm using is going to work. Then I'll bypass it, you know, copy the setting, and then bring it down in audio suite and make it, you know, just put it right into the, 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 uh, the clip. Right on. That makes sense. <laughs> Do you ever feel like the time that you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take you years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of our students, David, quote, absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process that I've ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along along the way, but condensed into a six to seven hour session, close quote. Look, I'm so confident that this will take your mixes to the next level, that if you can't get a killer mix within 30 days, I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So if you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and start now by checking out the free preview of the ultimate snare mixing trick. And I'll see you at the front row table of the Grammys. Cheers. All right. This question comes in from Dave Kalmuski. It may not be entirely serious. 
He said, since Chris is also known for being first on a plane occasionally, are you perhaps first on the helicopter? <laughs> 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 so, so I, was, I did a couple where I was, you know, I don't first the first I don't do social media, but I, I'm I'm not. I I like it when, like when I'm the last guy on the plane, yeah. that's winning. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like me. to send Chris a picture of a plane full of people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then me. I'm usually but, the last guy on the plane because I'm like I don't want to get in this line and rush no, but, to get on there. There's got to be a seat. I can tell you that when Chris and I travel together, you know, when he used to do it, he did, I don't think he does it anymore. Um, I used to egg him on, you know, like I used to, I, cause, cause you know, like I, we, I did a trip one time. It was Chris I and, and his daughter and she was just mortified, but I was going, I go, no, no, man, you got to make a joke out of it, man. Just, cause watch him. Cause Chris will like, he, he'll like knock little old ladies down, you know, to be the first <laughs> one, you know? So I'm like, Chris, man, you can let that guy cut in front of you, you know, cause that's just what we do. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's he, awesome. He, you got to give your older brother a hard time for all those headlocks he had you. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> but no, he's Chris is he's awesome with the the whole first on thing. Was, it was pretty funny. funny. I you think know? Chris has got a great sense of humor, man. Um, all right. So so this question comes in from Roger Allen Nichols. Um, he said, there's a couple of parts to it. Um, with all the changes in budgets and advancements in Pro Tools, how much do you work in the box I think you you answered that question so far pretty much, but if there's anything more you want to say about that, feel free. My console, first of all, you know, I've worked my entire career on this console, on, on the SSL 4000 series. You know, I, I pretty much 99% of what I've ever done has been with this console. So part of the reason why I have it is just out of convenience to me. You know, it's layout, where the speakers are, are you know, the, the, the where the speakers sit, you know, in reference to where I sit, you know, the volume control, all that shit. It's just, it's comfort. Yeah. The con Look, don't get me wrong. The console has an amazing sound. And I figured out how to maximize the analog path that I'm running through digital audio through so that I get the benefit of using the console. But 99.9% .9 of what I do is all plug-in based. And the console is used more as a mastering tool. And then again, the one thing mainly is is volume rides. So again, there's still once I've hit the sweet spot, getting the cons, getting the drums into the console, right? I can't raise them in Pro Tools because I'll start to clip. So I have to use the console automation. So, right, it's almost like an additional headroom. Correct. And so, again, the console is really more of like a, treated like a mastering feature, feature, and and Pro Tools I use is like a multi track on steroids. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, that answers the second part of his question, which is, are you summing externally from Pro Tools? I am. So, yeah, yeah. All right, and now his next one is, um, do you use the Black Lion Bluey 1176? Yeah, I do. I think it sounds amazing. Right on. And then my addition to that question is, what tips do you have for us when we're doing lots of vocal compression and we start to get into crazy S's and stuff like that? How should we deal with that stuff? Right, so... If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you've recorded, right. So when you get into heavy compression, the singer now sounds like he has asthma. Right. His, his breaths are, you know, as loud as the vocal. So what you do is you clip gain the breaths. And it's usually, the sweet spot is usually 20 dB. So it depends, I mean, that's 20 dB based on my compression. So, right. um, I'm a big fan. I love the BF76 plugin, which is the a a right on. Avid. The, uh, it's the 1176. It's the very, you know, like, it's a modeled, you know, 25 years ago. But yeah, it's the first just one we got. It's just something about that plugin and the way that it spits, you know, that I really like. So, and for me, it's a, you know, four to one ratio, quickest attack, quickest release. And then the amount of compression is, is super easy. Just turn the input knob up all the way, and you got it. And then adjust the output to to be at the level you need it to be. But again, it brings up all that background noise, so you have to go through. And so at that setting, it's a twenty dB clip down, you know, clip gain down of your breaths, and then you put a little crossfade on the front. And if you're having issues with S's or anything that's hit, 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 that like a, a K where the attack is too much, just tab the transient and put a soft a fade on it. And it will just trim enough off of it. And the same with an S. 
you would just put a fade, you know, just drag a fade across the S so that it's not coming in at 20 dB of compression. You know, you have right to, on. you have to, you have to fudge it. You know, you have to finagle it to get it to work how you want it. But that's how I do it. That's how I do it. How I used to do it. Like, I don't know if I did it with the trick. So when you were there mixing, but I had the Sony 3348, I would actually just, it had an auto punch feature. So I would just punch in blank space to lower the volume of the breaths. You know what I mean? I put right. in a maximum crossfade. You know what I mean? I would audition it and made sure it worked good. And then I would literally, it would it, it wasn't enough to erase it. It was just enough to lower the level of it. Yeah, that was another thing I learned. So you had me off to the left and I was running a Pro Tools rig and editing and getting tracks ready to feed over to you. And, you know, you had me clean up the vocals where the, I'd trim the beginning of it, fade out half the breath going into it, and then find the perfect fade out to trim the end of each word. Because while we were working on the record, we had no idea that that was, that there were even issues in the sound. But once you started dialing in the vocal and the compression, it like right. brings everything to the front. That's now right. all of a sudden it's like exposing all these That's warts right. and, you know, right. not warts on the sound, but, you yeah. know, all these little details come out. Yeah, but I mean, that's, you know, again, so you, you can you can use the massive compression. It's it's just going to require you, you know, it's like it's it's not the it's not the silver bullet in the shortcut. Like in other words, yes, it sounds great, but it comes with this caveat of like the guy sounds like he's got fucking asthma. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. because his breath is, <clears throat> you know, and and to make it sound naturally just do clip gain them down. It's such a great takeaway though. For you to be reminded by you that there's no set, there's not a lot of set it and forget it things. A lot of times we think engineering mixing is. I like, wish there was just one thing on and it's done. And it's like, no, you got to work. You got to work hard your ass off and, and earn that, your. That's, that's you know, right. Like your pay. If it if it starts with auto D, you know, if it starts with yeah. auto <laughs> or D, it doesn't and it isn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not a shortcut. Like the bass leveler. Oh yeah, that's just great. You know what I mean? Here, you know, it's like, yeah, it, move, it moves the fader up and down to change the level in accordance with the bass. But no, they, they never really, there's, there's, there's always a, you know, a trade-off. Yeah. You know, and well, to be quite honest, it's never as good as, as your ear and just doing it. And it, remember, so you spend the time and you do it once and then it's done. You know what I mean? Like, and, and again, I don't know what your, 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 your listeners are working with, but I'm working, like, I get a session, that session that I got, it sits in a folder, right? And I I open it up and then I, the first thing I do is I just copy it to another hard drive. So I have the original session that was sent to me untouched. Then I have the one that I'm working on. So this way, if I ever have to go back and pull something off of it because I fucked up, it's there. You know, like if you just think about it, like, but I, I don't want to clip gain the breaths of my vocal because that's my lead vocal. Well, duplicate it and then hide the original. You know what I mean? Just make sure that you take the dot dupe out before you send right. it to a mixer. <laughs> yeah, give it a name that's useful. Yeah, you know. I can tell you how we get those funny names is because when we're producing, we're moving fast and like the I, last thing I want to do is stop to rename something. Of course, but, I, I get it a million percent, but... You know, what it shows me, it's like, if you don't have time to do it right, you're not going to have time to do it again. Right. You know, so just spend the time and make it right. Like, yeah. okay, at the end of your day, okay, what mess do I have to clean up now? You know, I, yeah, I so. get it a million percent. It's the last fucking thing I want to do. But, you know, I'm spending a, a, a vast part of, not that, I mean, a majority, not a majority, but I mean, I'm spending... At least an hour a day just relabeling stuff. Yeah. You know? I think this is the shit that our grandfathers were telling us when they were teaching us you got to put your tools away after you're done working, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm guilty <laughs> of that, clean too. Up. So, yeah. All right, um, so last question from, from Roger, and then we can close out here. Um, although I do have one closing question. He said, how do you deal with listening volume and keeping your ears safe over years of mixing? What? There you go, Raj. You get that, <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I, I don't, I, I, you know, I listen loud when I need to listen loud, and 
you know, which is basically the beginning part of my day when I still have fresh ears, you know, drums, make sure that they're impacting, you know, and then I listen quiet the majority of the time. I got these great iLoud monitors made by IK. Nice. That that sound amazing. They they come with this auto calibration microphone that you just calibrate them. You know, you hook the microphone up, put it in their listening position, and then hit these buttons on the speakers, and it, it, you know it EQs them for your room, which is brilliant. And that's uh, to be honest. I mean, I, I use them to, to mix. You know, to do most of my balancing on and listen at, at kind of like a regular level, not real loud. And then. You know, you have to go and check it loud in a couple, you know, a couple times. And yeah. That's what I do. But, that's you know, cool. back in the I, day, when we were mixing the tricks, though, I probably had it on stun all day. <laughs> you know what? It's, it was fun to hear. That's all I can say about it. But, of course, I was just a young kid sitting there cranking shit up anyway. Um, all right. So, I got like a million other questions, which I'll ask you next time. You're so gracious as to come on our podcast. But, Tom, thank you so much for doing this. Here's the closing question. This is the hypothetical question I love to ask all my guests. We're going to take the Wayback Studio machine. You get to go back and find that young teenager who's sitting in the studio wondering what it would be like to make records all day, I guess. Even though what's funny to me is at the point at which you guys started this stuff, the whole industry was like, it didn't even quite exist what you guys were getting ready to create. So it's kind of fascinating to look at all that. But you go back in time and you find young Tom and you say, listen, dude, I've come back uh, to give you the single most important bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing to, that you need to know to become a rock star of the studio yourself one day. That was a long question. But what would you like to go back and tell yourself if you could go back and give yourself some advice, Tom? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. You I know, I, I immediately am going towards projects that I've fucked up. You know, immediately what comes right to mind are, are, are projects that one way or another, you know, I got, I had issues with like a very, very famous band that we mentioned in this interview that I'm not going to mention, you know, they, 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 they wanted me to mix an album. And the album actually turned out to be an amazing album by them. You know, one of their better albums. And uh, when I went out to lunch with them, we went to, had lunch at a sushi restaurant with the guitar player, very famous guitar player and the, the very famous producer. And it was a sushi restaurant. And I proceeded to get drunk. I, I don't know what the fuck I was thinking, but I got drunk at lunch and I blew that gig. And, yeah. and I regret it. You know, I was like, Fuck. You know, I think I'm a kinder, gentler Tom Lord Algae than I was 25 years ago, you know, and, and I think, you know, remember that we're here to serve the music. It's not about us. You know, back then I was so slammed and busy with work that I, I would just, as quickly as I could rush the people out of the control room and, and approve the mix, I would. And uh, I, re I regret that. And I've apologized to a lot of clients that I've worked with. I said, I I'm sorry that I did that. And here's why I did it. And I won't do it again. You know, just remember that we're here to serve the music. You know, and at the end of the day, it's not our record. And it's not about us. It's about the music. It always is about the music. Yeah. You know, if you, if you go into that like that, then you'll be all right. You know, more times than, than, than I'd, I care to admit, you know, it was more about me and, and that was wrong for me to do it. And I, I, you know, and I've changed, I've changed that. So that's what I, for young guys, just, just remember, you know, and especially if you are becoming successful and building a name for yourself, you know, you're going to, you, what you're doing is you're putting a target on your back. So the nicer you are and the nicer you are to your clients, they will continue to hire you. But the more that they hate you, it doesn't matter how talented you are. They'll, you know, the second that they can, tear you down and take a shit on you, they will. You know what I mean? But if you're a nice guy and treat them with respect and the dignity that they deserve, you're going to be okay and you'll do just fine. It's not about you. It's about the music. That's great, man. Great advice. Deep stuff. Um, and it reminds me that at the end of the day, we're all just listeners. We're all just listening. To That's, right. That's right. That's um, right. Well, Tom, thank you so much, man. What an honor to hang out with you. 
really, really gracious of you to come uh, hang out with us for two plus hours talking about making records. Yeah, great time. Please let the rock stars know, where, where would you like them to go learn more about you online? Um, what if they're ready to finally mix that hit record and they need a killer mix? Um, and I believe you do a lot of teaching online too. So if there's anything you want to give a shout out to. Yeah, no, I still, I mean, the pandemic kind of screwed that up a little bit, but we're, we're starting to get back into it again. I'll be going over and doing the Abbey Road Institute over in Paris shortly, um, you know, and, and hopefully mix with the masters again, you know, up to mix with the masters guys. But, uh, you know, I'm also toying with the idea of, of maybe, you know, doing something here since I have going to have two, two rooms. Right, so, and you're going to build a movie theater for us to watch you mix, That's right? right, that's <laughs> right. So, but no, I mean, you know, you can always go up to, you know, just Google my name and you should be able to come up to Spank Studios or I think it's tomlord-algae.net or I don't, you know, I got to, I don't even it's remember. Right, we, get, we got the link, we got the link. Yeah, it's, it's you too. know, again, it's like I have, a you know, a website and if you click on that website, contact us, it goes right to my manager and the web. The website still has the Miami studio in there when we're about to update that as well. But, the, you know, it's either the Spank Studios or TomMordalgy.com or .net or whatever the fuck it is. I don't even yeah. know. That's great. And a shout out to Kelly at Linear Management. That's too, right. So. Yeah. K Kelly's been my manager for a while now. We, we go way back and, you know, she, she's uh, she'll take good care of you. That's awesome. She's also well, in Nashville. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, I she's in Nashville. Connect with her. Say so thank you. She's she's been very helpful and brought a lot of cool guests on the show. So, Tom, thank you so much for hanging with us. Great to see you, and um, I look forward to running into you in person again. And maybe I'll be down in uh, Austin, Texas, at some point. Anytime, whatever. buddy. All right, cheers, man. Cool, man. Thanks, thanks for listening, rock stars. Thanks for being here, Tom. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rock stars now go make great music recording studio rock stars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who help make this episode possible owc lewitt adam audio isotope and Spectra 1964. And remember, at isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the link in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko and Braden Stremming for additional podcasts and video production. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.